uh, maybe one minute and then we are ready to go. Thank you. Okay. So, so good morning. We would like to um, ask the second speaker maybe to uh, give the first talk that we can uh, fix the technical issues. Is that possible, <laughs> Marcelo? Are you ready? Okay. So welcome again. Um, so this uh, session is shared by my colleague uh, Mustafa and me. Um, Mustafa is, was supposed to give the first presentation, but we have some uh, some say some delay. So I'm very happy that our second speaker is stepping in. Uh, thank yes. you very much. So this, the, this is a presentation, the French CS initiative results from the uh, 2023 Turkey Syria earthquake sequence. Please go ahead. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot, Thank you. the chairman, for and chairwoman to uh, invite me to uh, get to give this uh, presentation uh, about uh, uh, the French contribution, uh, the French contribution to the understanding of the uh, Turkey Syria earthquake uh, sequence. Uh, my name is Marcel Lobin Michele. I'm with the French uh, Geological Survey. Uh, but I'm giving this presentation on, on behalf of uh, the other authors uh, that you can see here on the screen from uh, CNES, IPGP in Paris, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and uh, uh, CNRS, which is the National Center for Scientific Research, uh, University of uh, uh, Strasbourg, ISTER, um, uh, which is the um, Institute for uh, Earth Science in Grenoble, uh, and uh, the French Space Agency again with Emily Mer. So it is the first time I'm giving a presentation uh, where I, I haven't done actually any processing, and uh, all the people that have done the processing are in the audience. Uh, so <laughs> let's go. <laughs> I'm actually presenting a, um, a group, a group of um, of a, say, enthusiastic uh, researcher in France uh, that gather together when there is a, a major uh, geophysical event uh, and they decide to study it uh, by satellite. We call this group uh, SIEST, second generation, which stands for Cellule d'Intervention Scientifique et Technique. I put this in French. I put this in English, but there are some, uh, some other slides in French for the people who want to refresh their French. And uh, this initiative fall, fall uh, within the national uh, initiative that is fostered by uh, this French space agency, CNES. And this national initiative is called the Formater, and is the National uh, Solid Earth uh, Group. You can go on the website and check it out, what we do. And all these uh, respectable institutions are, are involved. As you see, we are many. Uh, there is another national uh, national initiative, which it, it is a service, actually, a national service, which make use of uh, satellite imagery for surface displacement monitoring. And it's a, it's a mission from the state. Uh, so it is uh, actually fostered by the CNRS and the CNES. And this initiative is called Yes de Form. Yes de Form. So the result I'm showing here have been produced within two, these two uh, national initiatives, the Solid Earth Poll 
and he has the form. This is to be fair. <laughs> uh, so let's go. So within this, this two national initiative, there is this small group of uh, scientists, enthusiasts in INSAR and image cross correlation. That is called the Cellule d'intervention d'expertise scientifique et technique. The idea behind it is that when there is a major geophysical event, like the earthquake in, in Turkey and in Syria, and the international charter of space and major disaster is activated, um, the idea is to use the data that are collected within the international charter on space and major disaster and make them speak in terms of uh, geophysical interpretation. We know that these data are used for the civil protection first, of course, uh, but then they are not anymore used for geophysical interpretation. So the idea behind this CS second generation initiative is to, with the help of CNES, gather these data and, uh, and use them for geophysical interpretation. So that's the principle. Of course, um, sometimes for, for what we do, especially in INSAR and cross-correlation of optical or radar imagery, uh, we need particular geometry of acquisition, which is not the same that is needed by the civil protection. So we, don't, we cannot all the time use this, uh, this data. So that's why also in this initiative, we allowed ourselves to use other platforms like JEP or the formatter platform developed by University of Strasbourg and CNES, uh, like GDM Optics and uh, GDM SAR. Um, so this is an example of what we do, like a rapid response. This is uh, a very small earthquake in, uh, in Letail in France. And we use also Sentinel-2 for offset mapping. And we use Pleiade for in volcanology. This is an example of the height of a volcanic plume in the Ubinas. That's it for the introduction. Um, so since I'm the first, I'm I mean I would I, I'm so I'm so glad that I'm showing this uh, this image in the audience. This is a, everybody knows I think in the audience this uh, this image from Armillo. 1999. So, uh, as you all know, but maybe there are people from signal processing in the audience that does not know a lot about tectonics and are willing to know. So, the the, um, the earthquake in Turkey uh, occurred in a very close to the what we call the triple junction, um, where the Arabian plate is uh, moving towards the Eurasian plate and it, it is squeezing actually Anatolian plate toward the west at the rate of, as you can see, uh, 20 millimeters per year. Uh, so this area was very well known by the Turkish colleagues and uh, um, by being an active uh, tectonic area. So I think nobody uh, that is dealing with tectonics and research in seismologists was, was surprised about this earthquake. And um, that's for the introduction. And um, what we did, uh, what they did actually, because I haven't done any processing, as I, as I said, um, my colleagues used the FlatSim service. A FlatSim is a it is a it is a service based on uh, INSAR processing, fostered by uh, the French Space Agency, and hosted by the French Space Agency that allow uh, processing of INSAR on a very large scale. And uh, it operates on the call, calls on ideas, so everybody can can apply, and you have uh, some space and some time to uh, to make the process yourself. Um, so this area was already studied by the French colleagues, especially from uh, uh, the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Um, and so this uh, one of the calls for idea. Uh, that was successful and was accepted by CNES for flat seam use uh, was actually uh, the, the me measuring of strain accumulation, particularly particularly in the, in this area. So as you can see in the small, maybe in the big image you don't see a lot, but if you look at the little uh, little image in the frame 
above, ascending and descending path, you can actually see the, the velocity of the three plates actually moving relatively one to each other. Um, so you can see the relative velocities before the earthquake. Uh, we plotted also here the seismicity. And this uh, work follows uh, the pioneering work of Olivier Cavalier that used the MVSAT actually to image the, the same area but uh, 10 years ago. I know Comet uh, Group also did uh, processing in this area. Um, so when the earthquake happens, uh, our colleagues at uh, Ister in Grenoble um, processed uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, data. And uh, as you can see, uh, we see the ground motion. Um, and uh, as we, from the INSAR community, we know when the, the, gr the fringe gradient is higher than uh, one fringe per, per pixel, uh, the, we lost the correlation. So you see that uh, as you come close to the, uh, to the fault, to the fault lines, the, the signal become incoherent. Um, we could also image uh, the, the small, uh, the small earthquake, small, I mean, magnitude six, magnitude six that happened southeast of the main, uh, of the main shock. So I don't know if we can call this aftershock or there is completely another earthquake. This is also a processing done with flat seam and facilities at Ister in Grenoble. And um, uh, as I said, when we are close to the, to the fault, as many of you know, and the, and the offset gradient is, uh, is too large, uh, we lose the, the interferometric phase. Uh, so in the CS group, there is also uh, Dean that, that you see, that you, that you might know him. He's, he works at the uh, University of Montpellier in Paris. And he tested the, the offset tracking. For those who might know in the audience, um, actually we don't use here the, the phase of the, of the SAR, SAR data, but we use the amplitude. And uh, when there is an event that has deformed the surface, the pixel is not imaged in the same position. So by using very, very, very precise correlators, we can actually track the, the pixel offsets between the two acquisitions before and after the earthquake. And this uh, methodology is not limited by high displacement gradient. So we can actually measure the offset very close to the fault, to the fault line. Uh, so this is just an example of the descending uh, path with Sentinel-1, so it's C-band, SAR. Um, and uh, also with respect to INSAR, offset tracking method allow to map the offset in the azimuth direction, which is the direction of the orbit of the satellite, and also in the range direction which is the line of sight of the satellite. So we have two information about the displacement of the surface of the Earth. So if we can imagine that you have ascending and descending path, you have four inputs, and so you can retrieve the 3D surface displacement. And this is what the Dean had done. Uh, so the color bar is for the, the vertical displacement, you use ascending and descending path of Sentinel-1. And the arrows are the, the horizontal displacement. There is no scale for this, but I guess uh, the bigger arrow here is four meters. Uh, so the idea is to use this kind of data then to, in a, in a, modeling, in a modeling procedure to understand what, what happened uh, beneath the surface and try to put some geophysical knowledge using this data as an input. So we are at fringe and uh, we are dealing with a uh, SAR interferometry, but uh, I, we wanted to show also these very uh, incredible results that the University of Strasbourg, uh, CNRS within the Formatair and the Geohazard TEP, uh, they, they had uh, very soon after the, the earthquake using Sentinel-2. Um, we can imagine in this in cross-correlation 
of optical imagery, we use the phase of the Fourier transform. So there is also a knowledge of phase. So I said, okay, even if it's fringe, there is a phase information that we exploit. Uh, so you can see a, a synoptic view of the surface displacement in the east-west and north-south displacement. And uh, I know these results are the object of a publication that will hopefully come up soon. The author are in the audience. So address all the questions to them if you want. And uh, I think I, um, I, I finished my presentation. Uh, we have something in the to-do list. Of course, uh, one of the, um, the main, uh, uh, say, the main advantage to be in this uh, CS group, it is that is the group is fostered by CNES, the French Space Agency. So actually, we have um, a privileged access to Pleiad high-resolution data. Uh, but uh, since the, the area to be imaged with Pleiad, which are, it, is, it is a high resolution uh, platform, it's very large in this earthquake. Uh, actually, uh, the work is not been done yet, but it is on, in the to-do list. Uh, of course, we wish to use also l band SAR. We already saw some, some results on these earthquakes and this earthquake, and we know that offset tracking and INSAR also give amazing results <clears throat> that can be used as input for the modeling. And then, of course, I spoke about your physical understanding of the phenomenon. On the to-do list is the modeling interpretation of the data. And with this, I finished my presentation. Thank you. So thanks for being so much in time. We have time for questions. Is there any question? With a big group of people contributing. Yes. Uh, yeah. What about the Morocco aspect? Are you initiating a similar response? Okay, the question is uh, from uh, Sigurjon Johnson, and he asked uh, if we, as a group, uh, formatter and yes, the forum, we did the uh, processing on the Morocco earthquake. And the answer is yes. Uh, we have already some results. And uh, I didn't show them here, but I have it on my computer. <laughs> um, because I, I didn't think it was pertinent with this session, but uh, maybe I should have shown. Yeah. It is pertinent. It is, I guess, yeah. But yeah. Just a few days ago. Mm -hmm. I, I have them, so okay. we still have yeah. time. We can show it coffee later. Coffee break, huh? Yeah, in the coffee in front break. front of the computer. Yeah. Okay. Are there more questions? No? Comments? Comments? And the results I have on my computer are from uh, Grenoble, Easter. It's not myself. Okay, John. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, thanks for that. Um, well, the, the comment and the perhaps a discussion for later as well is because um, we face the same things. We produce these things and then you've got two directions. You've got the science that you do with it over the months. It used to be years, but now it's months and weeks after. And then there's what impact you can deliver it. Could you just comment on how you feel with this one and the Morocco event, where we should be thinking? Should we stay in the scientific domain? Uh, are we delivering products and we do delivering the right ones? Uh, and is there something else we can do to have a bigger impact in terms of disaster risk management? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, John, for the question. Uh, this is a definitely very pertinent issue, uh, particularly when we are dealing with the International Charter on Space and Major Disaster, uh, in, for which INSAR has never been a useful tool for civil protection and in immediate response to the disaster. Um, I have a very personal opinion. Uh, I am a scientist, so I want to stay on the science uh, part because it's another job to do a quick response for really helping the people over there and the institution over there. It, it, is, a really another, it is another job. So I think we should stay on the science. We should stick on the science. <laughs> I, that's my personal opinion. There are other institutions involved in, in the communication with the civil protection, management of the disaster, of the sick disaster, United Nations in Geneva, and they, they're doing a great job. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Uh, thank you again also for, for, for jumping in. So for those who are late, we switched the first talks um, due to technical issues. And um, now we have um, Mustafa uh, Megraoui to give a presentation also on the Turkey earthquake with the title Earthquake Cycle Deformation Along the East Anatolian Fault Implications from the 2023 Earthquake Sequence Rupture Faults the Behavior and Historical, Seism uh, historical Seismicity. Um, and there will be maybe a slide or two on the Morocco earthquake as well. Yes, yes, yes. This is what I, I was trying to fix. Uh, yes, just a few days after the Moroccan earthquakes, it would have been really a pity if uh, not telling a few words on that earthquake. Uh, also, with regard to the number of victims that are, is growing and growing these days. Uh, so first, uh, the uh, earthquake cycle deformation on uh, along the 2023 uh, uh, earthquake faulting. And uh, what the earthquake tell us about the fault slip behavior and also taking advantage of the historical seismicity. Uh, how can I proceed? Here, okay. Uh, so this is a collaboration work with uh, Ziadin Shakir from the Istanbul from the Istanbul Technical University, and then uh, Samihan Gita from the uh, Kandili Observatory, and uh, Ugo Doyan for, from the Yildiz Technical University. So these are all colleagues we have been collaborating since a long time uh, in Turkey. Uh, no, it doesn't. Okay. The, the reason we um, we decided to do some work there because. From 2003, 2007, we had a European project uh, named APAME for the archaeopaleoseismology in the Middle East, and uh, we investigated the region uh, for days and days. Uh, so we, we measured the, well, we mapped the fault, uh, the North Anatolian fault, but also the Karasu fault, and then also Ismani Karatas fault. And then uh, we proceeded with the measurement of the uh, geomorphology with the offsets, uh, the cumulative offsets along the fault. So I'm not going to show the results of this on this slide, but I wanted to, to, to tell something about it. So the earthquake, as my predecessor has said, so it took place along the Eastern Italian Fault, but uh, most of the uh, surface faulting uh, took place also along the Karasu Fault, uh, which is uh, Okay, I'll go back. We go back. Yes, <laughs> yes, right, yes. Oh, then forward, yes. Okay. Okay. And then left, right. Yes. Uh, so we investigated the area. We mapped at the beginning the fault in detail, and uh, uh, what happened in in last February was no surprise for us. It was clearly uh, the fault that we investigated. You see here the two. Uh, the two maps, uh, one uh, that we did before before the earthquake, and uh, yes, okay, this one it was before the earthquake, and you see the diamonds here are the DPS points that we installed as well, and uh, this is the uh, the trace of the fault with the seismicity during the 2023 earthquake, with the first main shock and the second main shock, and. Uh, so we also decided to do some full field work and go and visit, uh, investigate the, uh, the, the faulting. Uh, so you see here uh, the offset, the very nice offset all, all, all along uh, the 350 kilometers uh, of surface faulting, fault plane with striations, uh, offset everywhere, even a, 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 a hill cut in two. Uh, and, and many other other observations and and markers where we can we can measure the uh, the, the offset the surface faulting. So we were interested basically on the M MW 7.8. Uh, we didn't go to the uh, to the 7.6. Right? It was too much too much work to be done. And uh, we carried on the work. Uh, I'm showing here the results of the Condor Ozel because they. Um, um, complement uh, the work that we did also with, with, with my, my previous my former student, Volkan, and uh, 
uh, we have this uh, uh, slip distribution uh, and plus other slip distribution that I didn't put here, but other, other measurements that we did in, in addition of what uh, Kondo and Ozark, they, they did. So we have really a, a, a good uh, uh, measurements and, and, and a good, good vision of the, uh, of the slip distribution along the pole. Now, uh, also have some, some observations. For example, this is the picture that I took before the earthquake in 2007. You see that here's the fault. Uh, some may say it's the thresh fault. It is not thresh fault. It's, a, it's, it's just a vision of the, of the flower structure uh, along the Eastern Atlantic Fault. And this is the northern edge. And there is also a southern edge of this uh, flower, flower, uh, flower structure. In 2023, you see the same the same, the same region, the same, the same, all the same, uh, the same um, uh, exposure, and uh, the same exposure with 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 the faulting here. Faulting well visible here, and also well visible here. Okay. What's interesting here is that for those interested by cardio seismology, you see here that there is a successive deposit. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, on the screen. Uh, yeah. Yes. So on this I have to. <laughs> I didn't, didn't, it's nice. I thought, I, I thought it's. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, yes. Okay. So I was just describing the successive uh, deposits here that we can see for those interested by final seismology. Uh, it means that this fault here um, uh, was moved uh, several times in the past. Uh, of course, now it is it is it's perturbed, and, and you see the you see the exposure. So it's a uh, it's uh, in the situation after the, after after the earthquake of, of February. Now about the GPS, uh, there has been some many many uh, uh, GPS measurements here since uh, uh, 2000. 2000. Uh, we had a student here, uh, Yasser Mahmoud, he did, did his PhD. And another student here, she. Uh, Sophie Bertrand, she did, did also uh, measurements here in the past, and uh, the group of Gebze uh, 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 and, and uh, Tubitak, uh, Samir Hergitar, and, and, and others. And then recently, uh, uh, Frédéric Masson from our, our, our institute with uh, uh, Ali Ozjan here, this is there. Uh, they also really measured the area here uh, after the earthquake, uh, well, just before the earthquake, was well, so after the earthquake. And uh, uh, showing that this is the uh, profiles, profile A, profile B, and uh, showing here the uh, velocity here in the in the uh, in, in in the area. Uh, we didn't really put here the the offset, 2023 offset, just the movement between the two blocks to measure the uh, the velocity. So. Clearly, it's about eight millimeter uh, uh, along the Eastern Atlantic Fault and 5.3 along the Karasu Fault. Now about INSAR, and uh, uh, so at the, at the beginning, we uh, decided to investigate the uh, uh, Sentinel one, and uh, uh, you see here you see the, the the faulting in blue, and you see here the, the fringes of the ascending and descending. Uh, uh, you see also the, uh, the the noise that is uh, 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 that exists along 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 the fault, so it, it, it's noisy. So and also the the uh, um, correlation uh, is not it's not very good actually. So it was difficult uh, to uh, let's say compare what we could measure in the field in terms of uh, slip uh, slip distribution. Uh, with uh, the uh, Sentinel uh, data. So what we did, uh, we went to the ALOS and uh, with the L-band, and uh, uh, so this is the ascending and descending. And uh, with the L-band, we could really have uh, a good vision on, on, the, on the slip distribution along, along the fault, uh, especially for the descending, the descending track. And uh, uh, so with the ALOS sensor, uh, we could compare what we observe in the field uh, with, with what the, uh, the INSAR is, is giving to us. Another uh, that's already shown, but uh, 
I, I like to see to to show this this uh, these maps because this is from uh, Florian and Florian she is in the in the room here. Uh, so uh, what is interesting in in these two maps? Uh, this is the north south displacement. This is the east west displacement. This is done up about one week after the earthquake. So one week after the earthquake, you could really trace the fault already. Uh, you see completely on the two on the two on the two the, on the two maps. And I think this is uh, this this was a challenge, and this is exceptional because as far as I remember, uh, when we, we studied earthquake back in the in, in time, let's say 20 to 30 years. Uh, when, I'm, when I began my PhD, uh, we could not have this, uh, uh, this, this, what, this uh, 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 mapping, uh, and, and even for some, some earthquakes, the mapping took place three years after the earthquake. Uh, and now, one week after, we have, we have the full thing, so we can go exactly, and you see the detail here of the, the trace, and we can, we can hide the resolution, and you can go and investigate the, the, the trace, the fault trace, and compare with what can, you can observe in the field. So this is, I think, an, an, an exceptional. Uh, now what we did also did some modeling. Uh, we inverted the slip distribution at the, at the surface, and uh, uh, also from inside, from uh, pixel offset measurement, and also from, from image correlation and uh, done not only by our team, but uh, several teams uh, around, around the world. <laughs> and uh, so here, by doing the inversion of this distribution of the surface, we obtain this distribution here. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, not very well uh, resolved here in the, in the screen. Um, but anyway, uh, what we see, see that uh, the maximum displacement here corresponds to maximum displacement in, 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 in a long track here. So the inversion is quite nicely picture the, the steep distribution along the fault. So this is the... Uh, uh, now we did also the, uh, uh, the modeling, the strain and the strain distribution here. Uh, we had some difficulties though. Uh, uh, so always we have nice mapping, fault mapping here. For, or, mass fault mapping, and uh, uh, the slip distribution here. The slip distribution, you have here the, uh, the, the scale, and uh, with the, the model and the observed uh, uh, slip. Uh, we had some difficulty in between the two, the two faulting here. So we're not happy with these, uh, this distribution here. It, uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's a problem. It's a problem also because the only way to uh, benefit from the INSAR it was to uh, uh, calculate the, uh, the interferogram for both earthquakes at the same time, because we did not have, a, have uh, other images in between the, the two earthquakes, meaning in between uh, the first earthquake at two, two, 2 in the morning and the second earthquake at, at 11 in the, in the morning. So uh, this is the, what, what we can obtain in terms of uh, the distribution. This is very important uh, the modeling because we wanted, we were interested in what, what's happening in the Karasu Valley here, uh, because we were interested also on the, the influence of the 7.8 earthquake on the Dead Sea Fault. And uh, uh, we tried to do here, for example, a Coulomb friction model. And uh, we see here immediately that uh, the 7.8 uh, uh, loaded the uh, the, uh, the the child like the child like uh, fault. And uh, perhaps here I didn't put the the Dead Sea fault that is here. Uh, uh, very probably the 7.8 uh, loaded the, uh, the the Dead Sea fault. So this is this is a work in preparation that we're trying to uh, understand uh, what's what what's happening and what will happen maybe in the near future. Uh, another, another work that we did already, this was, this was in 2006, uh, in this uh, triple junction, say previously, like between the Arabian plate and the uh, Anatolia microplate and also the African or Sinai plate. And uh, we do not understand what's the role of the, 
of, of the cycle subduction zone here with regard to the triple junction. Uh, we don't have much of the historical earthquakes uh, along, along the cycle zone. Why? We have uh, several uh, historical earthquakes along the Dead Sea Fault and also several historical, uh, historical earthquakes along the, along the Eastern Anatolian Fault. So this is the, uh, what I can say uh, as a report about the, this earthquake in Turkey. Now I would like to move on, I think we have, I have five minutes? Yeah. Move on just a little, huh? Three minutes? It's okay. Very rapidly, what happened in Morocco? Yes, well, uh, I did some field investigations in 1995 and 1996, uh, one month each. And I was interested by the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the famous um, Agadir earthquake and wanted to understand why the earthquake took place there and what can we observe actually in terms of earthquake. So the Abbasil earthquake in Morocco, Abbasil because it's the name of this village here, uh, who uh, you, you see this, this quarter here, it's totally destroyed here. And this is a, an image given by uh, my former student, Samir. Uh, who is now working for UNITA in Geneva. And uh, they did a very nice work, many, many images uh, from Pleiad and, and, and other, other, other satellites and uh, constellations. And, uh, and finally, they did this uh, damage distribution. And uh, you see here that uh, uh, all this region here has been badly, badly damaged. Uh, this is, you can consider this as an intensity 10 in, 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 in EMS 98. And uh, you see uh, uh, the town of uh, Marrakesh, the city of Marrakesh is, is maybe in 10, 9, 8, 8 intensity. So many of the villages here, they didn't survive, they're completely destroyed, and uh, this explains the, uh, the, the number of, of, uh, of victims. So here is the damage, so I think. The thing is that uh, some of the roads here were completely uh, blocked by, by, by landslides, by, by, by uh, uh, falling, block falling and, and, and everything. So uh, we, the people there needed uh, a bulldozer to, to, uh, uh, to free the, the, the access. So, uh, but not all the villages they have bulldozer. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Some of the uh, villages are completely destroyed. This was this is with the concrete, but the concrete is really useless in this in this situation. Uh, going back to the 29 29 February 1960, you see also very very damaging uh, damaging earthquake. You can see here also at that time some people they they mentioned about 12,000 victims, but uh, uh, so it, it was uh, and the 12 February, February is. Uh, uh, well, 29 February is uh, 5.9 earthquake uh, magnitude, and uh, the intensity is 10, or equivalent to the to the, the one of uh, last Friday. Uh, and uh, so at that time, uh, I took the intensity down by uh, Jean-Pierre Roté and uh, in in the area, and I went visiting this area here to see if there was any surface faulting because Jean-Pierre Roté has this, uh, this uh, attitude, it takes a lot of pictures, and I took all the pictures and tried to see, and indeed here you see what we call the flexural slip faulting, that not many people, they, 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 they observe it. And uh, uh, so this is the trace of the fault here, clearly, and uh, I did just a, a simple Okada uh, uh, model, and uh, uh, on, on, the, on, on the folding, it is a very nice folding. You see here the, the cross section uh, with the fault here, uh, interpreted, of course, and it's a curved fault. So this is what I, I, I did uh, uh, in 1988. Uh, yes, okay, I'm very rapidly. So uh, the, the molding gives uh, uh, also MW 5.9, and you see here about 25 centimeters at the surface. This is what I. I now the recent earthquake, uh, uh, it's right, right next door, uh, maybe 100, 150 kilometers. And uh, you see here, I took the uh, result given by Lixar, 
and I put it here, which is shows very nicely here. But perhaps it's not it's not it's a blind it's a blind fault. But uh, you see, you can trace still can trace here and uh, do the trace tracing the, the faulting with previous previous observation. And the, the Agadir is here, and the fault is here. So it was the same system of press faulting going all through, and this is what we call the uh, South Atlas, Saharan Atlas, uh, super zone between the, the African platform and, and the Atlas mountain here. Uh, so in this region, there has been also uh, uh, historical earthquakes here, 1719, that destroyed Marrakesh, back in time, and 1783, that destroyed Agadir, back in time, uh, 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 so two large earthquakes in this area. So it means that area was shaken by uh, several earthquakes in the past. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm not going to comment the, <laughs> the modeling here, uh, and that's it. This is the mod Tukal 4167. Thank you Voila. very much. Do we have an urgent question to Mustafa? Urgent. <laughs> okay, thanks for the for the very recent results, Mustafa, uh, for sharing that with us. We move on to the next presentation. Keep a bit of time, and uh, this is given by Yuan Liu and from Kaos, and it's a fault zone damage and fault slip on the 2023 earthquake estimated from 3D displacement derivations of satellite radar images. Please, the stage is yours. Uh, okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Ji Hong from Cost, and uh, here is uh, my co authors and uh, with uh, Yang Linger and Xin Jun Zhou and other Jin and Ariano. <coughs> so, today my topic is about the all fault damage of the 2023 Turkey earthquake from the three dimensional displacement of satellite radar images. Okay, <clears throat> my uh, my presentation mainly focuses on two uh, two sections. The first is the cosmic uh, three-dimensional displacement uh, measurement, and uh, the other topic is about the fault damage from this uh, three-dimensional surface displacement. Okay, first uh, the uh, 3D displacement from radar images. Okay, here is the study area. As we can see, this earthquake uh, ruptured uh, the East Antony fault and another North fault, another fault uh, in this event. And uh, the total uh, fault lines uh, reach uh, more than more than about uh, maybe about uh, 500 kilometers. And uh, here. Uh, we first uh, collect uh, the Sentinel-1 <coughs> radar images from ascending and descending. Here we need uh, two orbit to uh, ascending orbit to cover the study area and uh, one descending orbit uh, uh, images to cover the study area. And uh, the uh, LS2 images is also open to the public and uh, we also collect uh, the uh, three tracks of ascending and uh, two tracks of descending LS2 data. So we we uh, we have here uh, each orbit of the uh, radar satellite images. And in order to process all this data, we use the DSR uh, range uh, spectrum split ESR and the pixel offset tracking and the MAI. <coughs> Here we will introduce the result of different method. <clears throat> First, uh, the the DSR method, as we can see, we we get uh, for the, the the first three is for the Sentinel One images uh, due to the uh, limited the wavelengths and in the near fault region we can't get uh, any uh, valuable uh, signals, but. Uh, for the LS2 data due to a little longer uh, wavelengths, so we can get uh, more complete uh, uh, coverage of the deformations. And uh, uh, another uh, another method is the range spec spectrum split interferometry. Why I use uh, 
this matter because uh, uh, in the original interferometry for the Sentinel-1 data, we can see in some near field, uh, there are fringes, but uh, just due to the larger uh, deformation gradient, uh, we can't unwrap correctly. So we use this matter to try to again to process this data uh, to see if we can get any uh, signals from this matter. Uh, but unfortunately, this matter, uh, we also can't get the complete uh, coverage of the deformations. And also for the LOS2 data, due to the correlation uh, issues, we also get the, a little more noisier result uh, compared with the DNSR method. And uh, the next is the pixel offset tracking method. This is the uh, range direction. This, this uh, observation, uh, the observation geometry is similar like the DNSR and the range spectrum split inside. And but uh, due to we use the empty amplitude uh, uh, signals to get uh, the measurement, so we can get a very complete uh, result of the deformations compared with the base based uh, method. And also, we uh, we can get the azimuth direction measurement from the pixel offset tracking. But uh, uh, for the for the Sentinel One data, due to the limited uh, space, spatial resolution, so the noise is uh, very strong for Sentinel One azimuth measurement. Uh, and also, we can see in the in the LOS two data, there are also some uh, like uh, ionosphere signals here. So uh, this is the pixel of that tracking. And also we use the <coughs> multiple after interferometry method. Um, as we can see for the single one data due to the limited uh, bandwidth, we can't get a very, uh, very reliable results. But uh, for the LS2 data, we can get some signals, but also uh, affected by the maybe uh, uh, ionosphere uh, disturbance. <coughs> so we have so many, <coughs> so many radar images, and we can process them by many different methods. And here we we'll, we get uh, almost uh, 14, 14 measurements. So how can we use this measurement to interpret uh, this earthquake? So uh, my idea is about uh, we can combine all this uh, measurement into a three-dimensional surface displacement. Uh, of course, some very noisy images we don't use uh, to estimate uh, the three-dimensional displacement. And uh, here we use a method named the uh, SMVC method. So the the key innovation of this matter is uh, uh, if we to uh, if we want to establish the equations, we in introduce a twin model here. For the traditional matter, we just use one pixel here, and uh, if we incorporate the twin model, we can use the window measurement to estimate the center point three dimensional deformations. And uh, besides, we also use the variance component estimation algorithm to weight different uh, uh, observations. So we, because different observations have different uh, uh, accuracy. So the weight is to account for the different uh, accuracy. And uh, this matter that is the inside three dimensional displacement calculation based on stream model and the variance component estimation. And the code is also open. And based on this matter, we also we calculate the three-dimensional displacement. Like uh, like pre previous presentations, the the overall uh, pattern is very obvious. Like uh, uh, it is the drag, uh, the left lateral drag split, and uh, for the vertical deformations is relatively small. And uh, here is the 
the, the error here is the dumping for the horizontal displacement. Uh, and uh, here, based on the three dimensional surface displacement, we also uh, project the horizontal displacement to the fourth parallel displacement. Like uh, this uh, picture is the uh, along the the along rupture for the parallel displacement. As we can see, there are several slip peaks uh, in for these two events, and we also use the result to have a, a slip model. And the, the, there are several pe dis displacement peaks for these two events, which is uh, consistent with the surface uh, observations. Okay, based on the three-dimensional surface displacement, we further study the all-fault uh, uh, damage. Okay, for the uh, elastic case, uh, we can see for a very long-term uh, period, the total deformation uh, between across the fault, we can see uh, in the two, two sides of the fault, they are, are equal. But uh, 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 in, in the interseismic uh, uh, period, we can use the actin uh, function to fit the interseismic period. So if we make a difference between these two cases, we can get the, uh, the elastic for seismic deformations. It looks like uh, uh, this, this shape. And uh, the function does uh, make a difference between the total deformation and the interface make deformation. We can get uh, this function. But uh, in reality, in the real case, for example, this is a profile across the fault. The blue, the blue dot is the real surface observations. As we can see in the far field, it is, uh, looks like uh, the elastic case, but in the near field, there is a misfit, misfit uh, of the elastic uh, deformations. If we make a uh, differences between the elastic and uh, the real observations, we can get the differences of the, uh, of the residuals. As we can see in the near fault, this uh, is a very strong signal. This is just the uh, misfit here. So uh, here we just want to fit the, this residuals in the near, near field. Uh, because in, uh, after a distance, uh, the deformations, uh, the residual signals be, become zero. So we use the log 10 function to fit uh, this uh, near fault uh, signal. Uh, but, uh, uh, due to if we, if the the x close to zero, the log ten function will be very large. So we also add uh, another constant uh, to uh, prevent uh, this case. So after this fitting, we can get some parameters. The first uh, is uh, uh, we use the elastic uh, function to fit uh, fit the light, so we can get the total deformation in elastic case. Uh, and uh, also, we can get the unforced deformation. That's the differences uh, between the observations. And uh, the differences between the total and uh, the unforced deformation, we can get the offered uh, deformations. The offered dam deformations, that's uh, we think uh, the offered uh, the damage. And uh, also, we, do, we can fix uh, this function to get the uh, all for the damage width, that's uh, the two red rectangle between the two red rectangles here. And uh, after calculation, uh, these uh, parameters, uh, we can further get uh, the recent, uh, the ratio between the all for the damage deformation and the total deformation. So we can to see uh, how the distribution of this ratio along the ruptures. And uh, here is the distribution of this ratio along the ruptures. As uh, the background is the horizontal displacement magnitude, 
in the, the near fault uh, distribution is the all fault damage ratios. As we can see, uh, this ratio uh, occur in the two sides of the fault is uh, also in some area is also a symmetry, like uh, in the end of the two two ruptures, uh, and also in some local areas in the two side of the fault is uh, is different. And here is uh, we also show an example of the of the fault parallel displacement. Uh, here here it looks like the topography, but uh, be careful. This here is the fault parallel displacement uh, around the. 100 kilometer. This area is a good me. Here, as we can see, uh, the far field is uh, generally uh, like the elastic uh, piece, but uh, in the near field, there are uh, the, the the deformation magnitude uh, is decreased, and uh, here is just uh, the all fault damage zone, and uh, the red red area is just uh, the unfault uh, offset uh, of the ruptures. And uh, we also get some histograms of the of all fault uh, deformation ratio as well as the all fault zone wide. Uh, as we can see, for the all fault deformation ratio, there are several peaks uh, for the for these two cases. But uh, 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 but for the uh, all fault uh, zone wide is generally, I think, is uh, can be considered as a Gauss distribution. Uh, due, due to in the far field, uh, in the end of the two ruptures, due to the uh, the signal to noise ratio is a little a little very small, so there may be some some artifacts. Uh, for the ratio to extend uh, to larger than the 100 percent, and uh, this this uh, distribution in the wide distribution, I think, is also from the end of the two ruptures. And uh, due to the all fault uh, deformation ratio have several peaks, so uh, we 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 get this map. This map is just uh, uh, just to split uh, the all fault uh, ratio along the ruptures into several segments uh, by the just like this boundary. For example, for the first event, uh, the boundary value is uh, uh, 39 and uh, 16, uh, 16, 7 percent to uh, split uh, the all fault uh, damage ratio. As we can see, this uh, uh, this uh, between the 39 and the 67, uh, this uh, distribution that generally uh, uh, in the fault uh, geometry complexity and uh, also some band area. And also for the second event, uh, this uh, value is just uh, around uh, like uh, this, uh, this region, so the fault uh, complexity and also the band. And uh, there are also very some larger area, uh, larger larger values, uh, larger than the fifteen seven percent. This is just uh, in the end of the ruptures. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And okay, here come come the conclusions. And uh, we obtained the, the three dimensional topological displacement, and uh, also started the overall damage. And we opened the SMVC code to calculate the three dimensional displacement. And uh, thanks for your attention. That's all. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Thank you. Uh, nice images. Um, I was wondering, so on average, the you fault. Just present yourself from oh, sorry, from I'm Laura Gregory from University of Leeds. Um, so on average, a strike slip fault will be vertical, but we might expect the dip to sort of vary from off vertical along strike because it's a strike slip fault. So I was just wondering, could any of this kind of off fault deformation actually just be some slip at depth on a dipping structure? 
uh, you mean the vertical the vertical deformation? You mean the all for the damage may be related to the dipping direction? Just, yeah, maybe. you're actually just seeing some slip bed depth, uh, so it would be off the fault. Yes, if it was different. Uh, uh, I didn't present uh, in the in my presentation, and uh, I also tried to to look if there are any relations. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe maybe I need to carefully to check, and I can't answer you. Now. Yeah, maybe look for like pull apart basins or pressure ridges where we might expect the fault to be dipping in a certain direction, and then you could compare and see if all yeah. the deformation is going off in that direction that we would expect the fault to be dipping. That would be a good check. Yes, yes. This this is a good direction, but I didn't I cannot answer it. That's okay, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for your comments. Hello. Hi, uh, Tim Wright, University of Leeds. Um thank you for a great presentation. Um a couple of questions um related again to your off fault deformation. I guess some people in the past have modeled similar signals as shallow slip deficits. Um can you so if the slip Full slip doesn't reach the surface. Um, can you rule out? So can you be sure there's real deformation going on in that in that zone, as opposed to it's just a it's just all this elastic? One? And I'm thinking of you're very close to the fault. Um, can you distinguish between real deformation that is happening, you know, in in the rocks in the, those shallow, uh, very close to the fault, the off fault damage? Or just the slip not quite propagating all the way to the surface. Uh, Can you yes. distinguish between those two models? Yes, this is uh, this is also a question very uh, very confused for me. How can we distinguish between the uh, uh, shallow slip deficit and also the rock damage? And uh, mm, but uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer you. No. It's a very, very uh, uh, good question, and I can't answer how can we distinguish So it. Cecile said it's all deformation anyway, which is true, so maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. um, the, um, I guess a related, so a technical question then, in your 3D inversion using the strain, um, how big is your window, and is there a danger that you're smoothing over the fault? Uh, uh, this window I generally use like... Uh, uh, 15, 15 by 15, and the, the spatial resolution for one pixel is about 100 meters. And uh, a lot, uh, near the fault, due to if we use our window, it will incorporate uh, uh, two, two side pixels of the ruptures. Uh, I just uh, remove the other side of the pixels to calculate the near fault uh, Great. deformation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It looks like a question, maybe. Mm -hmm. Do you also have to the field and measure the uh, placement? I, I didn't go to the field. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I in Saudi Arabia. It's a, it's a long way to go Sorry. to the It's not a long way. <laughs> OK, we have just one quick question. OK. Then we'll move on. Um, one other thing I was thinking, um, sorry, Laura again, um, is, is there, have you looked at really well located aftershocks? Because that might tell you a bit more information about how wide we would expect the damage zone to be. Um, because you would kind of expect that damage zone to correlate with okay. the location of aftershocks. So that's okay. thing to okay. look yeah, at. Yes, I didn't come here, but I, <laughs> it's good comments that I will do it in the fire. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for the question. In the interest of time, we move on um, to our last presentation. I'm sorry we will be five minutes late for the coffee break. But we still will enjoy the presentation given by Jorai uh, Megan. Um, Co-seismic and early post-seismic deformation associated with the February 2023 Southeast Turkey earthquake, Dublin. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, I will present uh, our reconstruction of the deformation field associated with the Turkish earthquake. Well, uh, some emphasis on uh, how we reconstruct the uh, satellite uh, Flight parallel deformation field. So I think we can start. So I think the earthquake uh, doesn't need further uh, introduction. I just want to add a, a few important points. So the first point is the magnitude 7.8 uh, hypocenter is located uh, actually off the Eastern Anatolian Fault and structured uh, a branch of the Eastern Anatolian Fault just over here and then bilaterally uh, propagate uh, along the Eastern Anatolian Fault. 
and uh, the magnitude 7.6 earthquake ruptured the Soju Fault, which is the spray port to the East Anatolian Fault. So the, most of the inter-seismic strain is concentrated along the East Anatolian Fault and just a fraction of it uh, on the Soju Fault. So this point, point will come later. Uh, we will deal mainly with uh, Sentinel-1 data and uh, it's uh, three patches that uh, <coughs> were above uh, the earthquake location. So, uh, first of all, we start with a line of sight interferometry, I mean, and I'm calling it a line of sight interferometry and, and not just inside because uh, very sh shortly I will show uh, some burst overlap interferometry results. And as people mentioned, uh, the line of sight interferometry or INSAR uh, is very decorrelated uh, near uh, the fault trace and also uh, up to the north due to snow coverage. So, it provides very important data, of, uh, but uh, uh, usually uh, off uh, fault or far field data. The second data set that we are going to use uh, will be the, as other people mentioned, it's going to be the uh, pixel offset tra tracking data set. So we have for uh, all uh, three paths the pixel offset tracking data set. Well, uh, the lower uh, row showing the range offset tracking, and this is a complementary to the uh, info data set, and, uh, but it do uh, show uh, the data up to the four. Uh, and the other, uh, this upper row is showing the azimuth offset tracking. So this is the first data set that we are showing that showing the uh, flight parallel component of the displacement field. But uh, we can see that it's much, much noisier uh, than the range offset uh, tracking. This due to the fact that the Sentinel-1 pixels are a 1 to 12 a ratio in favor of the range offset tracking. And that's the result, the noise is a result of this fact. Uh, so we're essentially getting a meaningful data, data above the noise level, only in places where the satellite uh, to fault geometry are uh, almost optimal in this case and over here and some over here. All the other places uh, we are well into the signal uh, to noise or below the signal to noise uh, ratio. So the third data set that we're going to use is a uh, is a burst overlap interferometry. And this uh, interferometric scheme taking advantage of the uh, Sentinel-1 top observation mode, well, uh, it's viewing Earth in a burst, and each two consecutive bursts are overlapped by 10%. This 10% uh, creating two kilometer wide strips that viewed twice in each satellite pass. And this letting us to make interferogram in two geometry, forward looking and backward looking, and then take the uh, interferogram of the interferogram to retrieve the displacement in the fly direction of the satellite. So uh, here we can see the burst overlap interferometry results, uh, where we can see that we'll get much cleaner results than the azimuth of the tracking. Uh, we're showing only uh, one ascending track and the descending track, the second ascending track that we're taking later, the, in, the uh, image after the earthquake we're taking later, uh, was too decorrelated and we essentially didn't use it. And we can compare the uh, azimuth of the tracking and the burst overlap interferometry. Here to the left, the azimuth of the tracking, and in the middle uh, column, the uh, burst overlap interferometry. And we can look on profiles that are parallel to the range and parallel to the azimuth uh, to the right. And uh, <coughs> What we can see that, first of all, uh, that indeed the azimuth uh, offset tracking is much noisier than the burst overlap interferometry. And second of all, uh, as I mentioned, the hypocenter uh, of the 7.8 earthquake uh, was uh, uh, off the East Anatolian fault over here. So uh, this fault, which is uh, sub parallel to uh, the satellite flight, uh, is not observed in the azimuth offset tracking, the gray dot but it, we can see in the uh, burst overlap interferometry uh, more than two meter of offset uh, across this fault in the burst overlap interferometry. We will now uh, suggest a method uh, in, order, in order to merge those two data sets. 
essentially in order to preserve the uh, spatial resolution of the azimuth offset tracking and to uh, approach the uh, accuracy of the burst overlap interferometry. So here, uh, the method uh, will uh, use Kalman filter, which is an iterative uh, filtering approach. The equations are here uh, to the right, but I will not get into them. I will try to uh, put up a descript descriptive view of the method. So in a synthetic example, the blue line uh, represents our data where the gray dots represent the azimuth of the tracking with uh, very large uncertainties, and the burst overlap interferometry rep uh, represented by the red dots with small uncertainties. And the Kalman filter is basically uh, looking at previous uh, observation, and uh, based on the physics of uh, the, uh, our system, it predicts the next observation, here the pink dot, and then uh, by uh, taking into account the previous uh, observation uncertainties and the uncertainties of the current observation, it's out outputting the uh, filter data. So if we have uh, data that is very out of uh, the real data, uh, it will not be affected by as much. Again, predicting and uh, waiting between the two data sets and uh, the filter data. And we need to understand that because the burst overlap interferometry has much smaller uncertainty than the uh, azimuth offset tracking, it is essentially enforcing the uh, filter to uh, go for them and uh, to be close to the real data set. So uh, again, predicting and uh, small uncertainties will be closer to the, uh, uh, to the view data set. So we can uh, go through all the data sets and essentially uh, we're getting pretty nice results, but we can do better because common filter were designed to uh, process that we don't know the future, like a uh, surveilling airplane with a radar system, and we do know the, the future. We have all the data set uh, in the beginning, so we can go in both directions and get this final result, which uh, uh, pretty nicely following the uh, real data. So uh, here uh, to the left, we have the merge uh, data set of uh, of a burst overlap interferometry and azimuth offset. And uh, we can see that if we're uh, looking at the residual, meaning uh, the azimuth offset minus the combined uh, uh, data set, we're essentially getting an uh, uncorrelated noise, which is very nice. And secondly, we can uh, see that uh, in uh, profile R4, which is over here, it's also crossing the uh, fault that hosted the hypocenter of the magnitude 7.8. So uh, we can see that beforehand the azimuth offset tracking did not see that fault. And uh, following the, our uh, filtering, we do see that fault. Now we're taking uh, all of the data sets that we had, so uh, INSAR, uh, range offset, the merge, uh, burst overlap interferometry and azimuth offset tracking alongside GNSS data set, and we inverted for the sleep distribution along the fault. And this is uh, our sleep distribution of uh, the two earthquakes. So, uh, first of all, the magnitude 7 point earthquake, the sleep distribution is pretty patchy, uh, where uh, we have uh, three main asperities. Uh, this one, this one, and the uh, thousand one, uh, which is also uh, can be divided to uh, three asperities, uh, where the magnitude 7.6 uh, earthquake is much more regular with the maximum sleep of uh, 12 meters. So the maximum sleep in all the system in the two earthquake is actually in the magnitude 7.6 earthquake, not in the magnitude 7.8, and the sleep is decaying towards the uh, edges of the fault with the geodetic uh, moment, uh, which is about 10% above the seismological uh, moment. And uh, following our sleep distribution, we can calculate uh, our geodetic moment uh, relative to uh, rupture area. And uh, all the gray dots here are a reference to sleep continental uh, earthquake. And uh, we can see the, and the dashed line are uh, contours of equal stress rock. 
So uh, we can see that the, uh, actually the magnitude 7.6 earthquake uh, <coughs> uh, had a more than four times uh, the stress drop of the magnitude 7 point earthquake. Uh, so this could be uh, explained by the fact that, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the uh, 7.8 earthquake is uh, ruptured mainly along the Eastern Anatolian fault. So this is the main uh, plate boundary fault that uh, have the uh, larger uh, inter-seismic strain. And uh, the 7.6 earthquake ruptured along the Sojou fault that has smaller inter-seismic strain. And also the recurrence of uh, historical events are different. So uh, along the Sojou fault, uh, we don't have a uh, any above uh, magnitude seven earthquake uh, in the, record, in the uh, historical record. Well, uh, on the Eastern, Eastern Italian fault, we have many. So uh, essentially we have uh, an increased healing time for the Sojou fault, which produce a uh, larger stress drop. Another thing that we can see here in the lower panel, the uh, gray line represents the uh, alone strike uh, average uh, slip. And we can see the uh, three asperities that I mentioned in the previous slide. And those asperities are uh, co-located with a previous uh, segmentation of the Eastern Anatolian fault. So uh, uh, segment, uh, geological segments, uh, which, which are essentially separated by uh, releasing or restricting bands. And uh, we can compare the stress drop on those segments to historical events. And uh, essentially, the anonymous segment, uh, the historical event is uh, ambiguous. Uh, it might be uh, 200 or 1,500 years ago, so we will not address this one. But uh, on the two other segments, we have uh, an earthquake uh, 120 years ago, 500 years ago. And if we were calculating the expected stress drop of the previous earthquake, we're getting actually that the uh, stress drop during the magnitude 7 point of Eight earthquake was larger. So uh, this is in uh, respect to, uh, to hazard assessment. Uh, we can say that uh, a simple summation of, uh, of segments, uh, historical earthquake uh, magnitude will not produce uh, a large earthquake uh, that ruptures through the segment. I will finish by showing a preliminary result of post-seismic deformation above the location of the earthquake. So this is the cumulative post-seismic deformation of the first three months following the magnitude 7.8 to magnitude 7.6 earthquake. And two things I want to put your attention to is, first of all, the very large displacement just to the south of the Sorry, I didn't put it up, but it's just to the south of the hypocenter of the magnitude 7 point earthquake. So this has been really active following the earthquake. And second of all, that uh, it seems that uh, the continuation of the East Anatolian fault to the east uh, is creeping following the uh, magnitude 7 uh, point earthquake. And we can also compare the uh, co seismic to post seismic displacement along the East Anatolian fault just over here. Uh, well, I should mention that the, those are uh, different, different observations, so the co-seismic are from the uh, mm -hmm. offset data and uh, the post-seismic are from line of sight data. But uh, we do see that also the post-seismic is following the segmentation uh, along the uh, Eastern Anatolian fault. But we do, do see this uh, acceler acceleration uh, to the east. Uh, that correlate with uh, creeping uh, to the east of the East Anatolian Fault. And this is actually something that I didn't expect. I, I expect that we have a complementary uh, deformation, that uh, the maximum deformation in the post-seismic uh, period will be uh, well. we have minimum deformation in the co-seismic period. And I think I will uh, finish by showing the summary and will uh, be happy to get questions and comments. Thank you very much. Questions? Maybe I start with one. Um, so very, very nice, very nice results. So just um, with respect to the previous talk, when you do this climate filtering, 
Um, so you said you put some physics behind, right? I, I, the original Kalman filter is for some ballistic, uh, uh, I think, uh, so, trajectory. So what mm -hmm. is the physics behind here? So the, the physics is a very simple assumption that we're following, uh, we're uh, propagating uh, with the gradient of the displacement that we can uh, calculate in the previous observation. Okay, could the, could the, could there be a bias that you that you uh, have more displacement towards the rupture than there is there actually is? There could be a bias, but we don't see it. So the, so we only take into account the first derivative, and of course uh, this is not how displacement work when you think on an earthquake. Uh, but we don't see it when we look on the residuals. So we only see uncorrelated noise. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, are there more questions? I have a comment. Can I have a question first? <laughs> yeah. um, so maybe it's a question to, to all the presentations there. Um, uh, Mustafa showed that uh, he cannot really fit well the displacement between the two poles. So they're they are approaching each other very, very closely. Um, what is, uh, do you fit the displacement signal that you observe well in this region, in this um, were they coming close together, or this is is this problematic with elastic models? It's a bit. From, I think we're fitting that pretty well over there, but uh, it is problematic because you can get like the second earthquake uh, turn into the displacement of the first earthquake around. And uh, okay, but you can fit the, the data. You can but fit you the data, maybe not distinguish uh, well where it's coming from the displacement mm -hmm. from which side. Well, I have a mark on you the last, last slide. Can, can you go back? One, two, three, four. Yeah, this one. I mean, what's interesting here, you mentioned that in the Amano segment, uh, you have uh, post seismic deformation that should um, complement the. Uh, that what I would what expect, I but, but that's not what I'm seeing. I would expect that the maximum post seismic deformation will be where the Co-seismic deformation is minimal, but that's not what I'm saying. In the, no, at least the, not, not between the animals and the... The blue stars are, are the... Post-seismic. Post seismic. Mm -hmm. So the post-seismic, uh, the, the number, the high, high post-seismic activity in the Amanos along the Amanos segment, what does it mean? It means that... Uh, it means that... Complement? What I meant is here that I would expect that here we see that a correlation between the maximum uh, pole seismic and cold seismic and also over here. Yeah. And I would expect the opposite that the maximum pole seismic would be here where the cold seismic was minimal. But yeah. But but my question is what's the meaning of your uh, large number of stars uh, along the Amana segment? That means that at least from the initial result, there is significant post seismic uh, deformation formation. on the amino. Okay. Is that this deformation didn't take place during the main joint? So this the post seismic deformation is just. Is that a comment? Tim? I have a question, actual question. Okay. Uh, if that's all right. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, I guess the question is the post seismic after slip, the shallow after slip looks really low in this earthquake. Do you have any thoughts about why that might be? I mean, compared to some other big earthquakes, we see really fast after slip. And by this, you've got what, one or two centimeters at most. Um, have you thought about what that, is there any thoughts about what that might, might mean about the properties or off-fault off deformation? Or It's becoming a comment, sorry. It was supposed to be a question. <laughs> Um, actually, we didn't totally uh, thought about it, but uh, and if it's really uncommon, if I believe you, if you say so, but I didn't uh, check it. Well, I, I think it would be <laughs> interesting to look at. I, yeah, I, that's my sense is it's lower than some other big earthquakes, but I might be wrong. Only three months, but you got like after the Napa Valley earthquake, you had that much deformation in a in a, a week. Yeah.
So there is another question, <laughs> uh, but then we have to, I guess, to wrap up. Yeah. Maybe, okay. maybe you can um, leave the last one. Laura Gregory again. I was wondering, so your segments, um, you know, one idea about fault segments is that they scale with the width of the seismogenic layer, but these are obviously a lot larger in order of magnitude bigger. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, so depending on the model, so uh, you're thinking that the magnitude will start to scale at when the length will be 10 times the larger of the width. This is not the case in those segments, so they are less than 10 times the, uh, the width, is, the length is less than 10 times at the width. So we do expect some, uh, some correlation between the length and the, uh, and the magnitude, uh, but not as much as we see. But a lot of people suggest that segmentation on faults scales with the thickness of the seismogenic layer. So I would expect the segments to be like on the order of 10 kilometers rather than 100 kilometers. So can you convince yourself that there is any smaller segmentation in the surface deformation? I think in the MNES section, which is the longest, definitely you can see other segments. And there are also a yeah. geological mapping of a releasing, releasing and restricting band in the MNES uh, section. And I would not say so for the two other segments. Okay, what we suggest is that there will be a round table discussion at the end of the day. So please, uh, Keep this in mind. I think if you have a question or or or, or a topic that uh, should be discussed at the end of the day, so in the right roundtable discussion. Yes, and then come back again. Four four fifty p.m. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much for. Thanks uh, to all the presenters again. It's good. We <laughs> did it. Survive it. Yeah. I prepared my Is this, this is your USB stick or not? Merci beaucoup. Ah, pas de souci. Ça, c'est pas à moi. Non, non. Merci pour. Comment ça se fait que tu n'as pas un accent français quand tu parles vraiment? Ah, c'est parce que.
Check, 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 check.
Okay. Okay. Is it me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, as I was saying, welcome. Uh, 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 we want to, to this session on uh, thematic mapping. We are having uh, five five uh, presentations today. So we are starting with uh, Bar uh, Bar uh, um, Schweißhelm, Schweißheim, yeah, mm -hmm. which will. Uh, uh, talk about the Tandemex DM change maps product and the uh, application. You have uh, uh, 20 minutes, of course. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I try to be fast. <laughs> You have this? Yeah. Is it? Um, this is a different one. Okay. Uh, okay. We have to order the, the slides on the shared folder. Okay. And we have to put it in the. Um, okay. Okay. Super secure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just secure. Can you take a look at that? Just imagine them changing. Would you mind um, going to the edge of the presentation with the Hello, Ola. Um, we, we've got some issues. Uh, okay, thank you. Hello, Magda. We, we, we've got some issues. <laughs> can, can you hear me right now? Yeah, but where's the USB stick? I don't know hey. if that's possible. Your USB yeah. in a stick? I there? think I have it. Okay, so good. Um, uh, can you hear me right now? Yeah. Yes, I think we, we can. We've got some issues accessing the shared folder for the slides. Every time, every time we enter the verification code, it says that the cookie is run after updated. Uh, okay, we're in Roger Stevens. Roger Stevens building for the uh, thematic or the thematic mapping session. Thank you very much. Yeah, Magda is on the way. 
Sorry about the delay, but <laughs> there are some issues with the system is so secure we cannot enter into the system. So. <laughs> Sorry about, about that. So, okay, so we are going to find, we're going to start with that. I think we have some visuals, so you don't have time. Sorry about that. No. Okay. Okay. So, um, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, hello, everyone. My name is Barbara Scheisem, and I'm here on behalf of my colleague, Marie Lachaise, who cannot be here. And I also want to thank all our co-authors and colleagues from DLR who collaborate with us for this new product. So today I will present to you the um, Tandem X Dem Change Maps product. I will start with a short uh, reminder on the Tandem X Dem products in general and explain to you the product and especially when and where you can get it yourselves if you're interested and then show you multiple applications and examples. But let's start with an overview of the Tandem X STEM acquisition and product. So the Tandem X mission started uh, in 2010. And in the first few years, uh, two global acquisitions were acquired in order to create the first Tandem X global DEM. You might know it uh, under the name Copernicus DEM, which is actually the edited version of the Tandem X uh, DEM data. Then in the following years, uh, additional acquisitions were made and it was decided to create a second global DEM data set um, with data mainly from the years 2016-17 up to 2020. And now the Tandem X mission and the two satellites are still flying, so we are still acquiring DEM data and we are all hoping uh, that this will leave us some time. So um, about the second Global Tandem X DEM, which is actually the third Global Tandem X acquisition, because for the first DEM there were two global acquisitions, and for the third, the third one is only one for the second Global DEM, as I already said, from 2016 to 2020. And the parameters uh, of the acquisitions depend on the land cover, um, you can see the, the table and the image over there. There are regions which were acquired multiple times, which are, for example, mountainous regions. But there is only the one global coverage. And the goal is to still achieve the same uh, absolute and relative accuracies. And since there's less acquisitions, how, how do we do that? So for the um, global DEM, raw DEM scenes will be put together and mosaiced for the global DEM, but first they are processed individually. And for this processing, we could now make use of the first Tandem X global DEM as a reference DM. And we use uh, two versions, two edited versions. One is the Tandem 30 edit and one is the Tandem Polar 12 for Antarctica and Greenland. This is because the Copernicus edited DEM was not available when we started the processing. So we use uh, DLR edited versions. Um, a simulated phase from this reference DEM is created and then subtracted from the interferometric phase to show you also some fringes at this conference. Here in the bottom, you see the interferogram for um, uh, one scene as it is, and then when we subtract the simulated phase, uh, it looks like the one above, and so the phase unwrapping is eased, and we call this the delta phase, it's also called differential phase in PSI, for example. And additionally to that, we also um, improve the spectral filtering of the processing 
and we pre-calibrate the scenes already on the reference DM. Now, um, this delta phase, um, we also looked at it and converted it directly to height, just to have a look. And this is not a dem change map yet, but actually this delta phase just converted to height. And this shall be kind of to show you uh, our motivation or how we decided to do the dem change maps. And this is over Iceland, just this delta phase, delta height, scenes mosaic together. In this case, blue is a decrease in height because this is as it was plotted at that time um, by our processor. And we decided, yeah, actually, that's a good product itself to have them changes. So in this case, it's not, but we wanted to create them changes. And uh, so the colleagues at DLR decided to create this product, uh, which consists of the dem changes between these change raw them scenes, so the new acquisitions, in comparison to the Tandem 30 edit, so the first Tandem X global dem. And the product has different layers. There are the dem change maps themselves. I will show images in a moment. There is a date layer, uh, height accuracy indicators, and then also the reference, so the Tandem X uh, edited version of the first dem we use will be available with the DEM layers, uh, an editing, editing mask, um, height error map, and land cover map. And this will be freely available from mid-October on over a DLR in a 30-meter posting. Um, to show you images, how it will look like, um, this is for the reference DEM, so the Tandem X uh, DEM 30 edit. Um, it had to be edited because the raw data, of course, there were some voids and holes which had to be filled and the water was flattened or by colleagues uh, of ours. And then there will be the layers, as I said, the dem itself, the height error map, an editing mask. In this case, you only see water because this uh, example only shows water, but in cases where there were fillings, you can also see then which Dem data was filled and how, and a land cover map giving uh, forest, water, permanent water, and non-permanent water. Then the dem change map product itself consists of the dem changes, so one new acquisition uh, minus the reference DM, then a date layer, which gives you the date of the uh, new acquisition, so this is pixel-wise an exact day and um, a height accuracy indicator, not a height error map, because in this case, both height error maps which go in are, um, yeah, are used for this. And we also provide a change indication mask, which gives uh, indication if there is uh, a change over a certain threshold, how the height accuracy map looks, if the edited dem was edited at this point, and we have different classes uh, in this mask. And you can see it's it's two dem change maps, uh, even though I said it's only one, one global coverage. But um, of course, with this global coverage, you have overlaps. And in some areas, you also have more than one coverage. And we wanted to provide um, the data, as much data as possible. So we decided to do two layers. These are called first and last layer. And which means for the first, it's always the first acquisition of the data which is taken for each pixel, and in the last layer, it's the latest acquisition. So if you have two overlapping data takes, um, for example, January and February, in one set there will be the January on top, and in the last there will be the February. Um, of course, this also means if there are not months, but maybe years in between, there can be jumps between the data takes and the product. But since there is also the date layer provided, this can be understood um, quite uh, straightforward. We also wanted to uh, say or give a little warning because these stem change maps, they give um, the topographic change with respect to the global tandem X stem. This is the dem change, not necessarily a physical change. Because for the first Tandem X global dem, 
there were multiple acquisitions and they were merged together. So there is no specific time point for the reference. And also, especially in vegetated or glacier areas, um, we only give the dam difference and we do not calibrate them yet specifically in any way. Um, this is now the picture I showed before for this delta phase, but now for the dam change map over the same area in Iceland and how it looks. And now you can say, okay, it looks nice, but there's this huge uh, stripe here. <laughs> but as I said, um, there are jumps due to different dates. And if we look into the data which is used or which is there, um, we have acquisitions, acquisitions in 2017 um, on these parts, and this one is from 2019. And of course, within two years, and especially different seasons, one is November, one is May, it will look really different. But you also have the date layer, so this can be um, explained. What we can also see in this um, example is this um, volcanic eruption from 2014 and 15, and there was a lava flow which built up the this lava field here, and we decided, okay, let's have a look, what can we measure with them change maps, and we added up uh, all the changes, and we got a volume change of 1.47 uh, cubic kilometers. The error in this case is only from the height accuracy indicator, so of course there are additional errors due to calibration which had to be considered. But still, for a rough estimation, this already agrees really, really uh, nicely with other people who did uh, measure this with this data. Um, another example, um, not in the cryosphere, but geosphere are open pit mining areas. There are, for example, Hambach and Garzweiler mines in, in Germany. And we had a look, so you can see 2013, an optical image, and 2018, from when the new dam acquisitions are, and then the dam change map shows, for one, what you can already see here, that this mine uh, grew, and it also shows that it happened a lot in the other mines as well. And also here, we <coughs> try to uh, estimate a little bit what we can, and the excavation volume, so what was dug out of the mine, which is actually the sum of the coal which was extracted and the overburden volume, we estimated to be approximately 490 million cubic meters. And we also compared that to what the energy supply company gives on their web page, and they say they extract approximately 100 to 120 million cubic meters per year. And since we have an interval of almost five years, and um, this fits together quite well. Um, a further example is vegetation areas. This is an area in Indonesia, and you can see on the left again the optical images from 2010, so first global tandem XDEM approximately, and 2018, which also is the date of this dam change map. And the changes agree really well with what you can see in the optical image, what changed. And now I also want to show you why we have these two layers of dam change maps, because in 2020, it already looks completely different. And if you switch back and forth, this, sorry, fits together nicely, but you can really see you need, or both are really useful. The same is true for deforestation areas. This is um, the Brazilian uh, Amazonian rainforest um, in an area where there's a lot of deforestation happening. And you can see both them change maps. One is mainly 2017, one mainly 2018. In both, you see a lot of red, unfortunately, which was uh, deforested. But in this blue circles, you can also see differences within the time period between 2017 and 19. So again, this shows there is just happening a lot, and it's useful to have both. Um, yeah, that already brings me to the uh, almost last slide, 
And a summary again, so the DEM change map products uh, consists of the acquisitions for the Tandem X DEM 2020, which will be the mosaic, and this will be available next year, but there it will be mosaic together again, and we use the acquisitions directly, separately, and co compute the difference to the first global tandem XDEM from these years for the DEM change maps. And then in the future, we also hope to be able to use all the tandem XDEM acquisitions and build real stacks from all the data we have, which is still ongoing. Um, yeah, and I hope that we will be able to publish that as, at some point as well. But for now, we have the DEM change maps, um, and this is just uh, another example of uh, New Zealand and uh, agricultural area, I think. And yeah, that brings me to the end already. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> also for for being being you know quite quite quick, so we are back in scan. Right. So, so uh, I think think we have time for for some quite questions. Yes. So you have to use the mic. Yes, please. For the people online. I mean, it, uh, it depends on the accuracy of the Tandemix attempts. Also, that's really dependent on where you are, how the coherence is, what the land cover is. But we already see, I don't know if it's, no. Okay, not move anymore, but uh, a few meters is uh, definitely visible. And if it's really low noise areas, even less, it, it depends on where you are, but. We are not interpolating over gaps, so there. I don't know which which slide or example are you referring to. Ah, yeah, that's uh, that's not for the dam change maps, but it was. Yeah, sorry, um, for the first global tandem X dam, um, they were filled by our colleagues, so we use it for creation of the dam change maps. But I think they used uh, other data from other. DMs and filled it about the details about that. I can give you the paper about the editing, what what was done and how, but I don't know about the details. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Abdul Qadir. I'm from University of Maryland. My question is related to this slide. Like you are showing agricultural fields right here and the changes happening there? Yeah, I'm, I'm not completely sure at the moment. I think it might also be like forest areas or agricultural fields. Um, okay, um, so if, if these are agricultural fields, like I just want to know what is the like error which you are getting in the agricultural fields because if you're measuring the height and the height variation is like zero to 35 meters, so it's too high for agricultural fields. Yeah, that's why I said maybe it's also like forests or maybe other vegetation, which is a little bit higher. Okay. I'm, I'm not completely sure about this example. And, and you also don't go up to 35, I think. you It's not saturated, the red. Um, yeah, but I can look up the region if you're interested. And generally, like, what's the error or the, uh, uh, like the error which we get while measuring the height using this DM? Um, that's, again, really dependent on where you are and how the coherence is, and that's why we put this height accuracy indicator. Oh, thank you. Height accuracy indicator also inside, which gives you uh, an estimate on the, on the accuracy. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, thank you. I think we should move to, to the, uh, the next talk. I think it's still working on that. Can we close the page? Okay. Uh, I, I think we should actually move the team because we are a little behind schedule. So you can speak later. <laughs> Sorry for this. Uh, so the second presentation is given by my uh, co-chair Carlos Lopez Martinez, and is about the combination of multi-track Sentinel-1 multi-temporal in SAR coherence and Sentinel-2 data in land cover and vegetation mapping, the Synco map project. Okay, right. thank you very much for the introduction. I just wanted to say that I'm here representing a group of people that we were working the last three years in this ISA project, so we are presenting uh, the results associated to the to the project. So this is going to be the, the, the agenda or the outline of the talk. So basically, the the, the context of this of this project is the Syncoma project, which started as I said uh, about three four years ago. Uh, here you have the the link if you are interested into the results. So the basic idea of that project was to explore the use of the C band Sentinel one uh, uh, interferometric coherence. Uh, to evaluate their capabilities for land mapping uh, on agricultural mapping. Uh, in essence, uh, what we did in, in, in that project is to combine the information provided by uh, interferometric coherence, the information provided by intensity, to, and to combine them in different scenarios. Doñada, which is the largest wetlands in Europe, South Spain, South Tyrol is an area with the steep mountains, and uh, in Poland, where we analyze uh, forested types. Basically, uh, the main result of, of that, uh, or the main outcome of that project is that interferometric coherence, the amplitude of interferometric coherence, is useful to improve uh, thematic mapping and uh, crop mapping. We got an extension of the project, and in that extension, what we wanted is to continue on this investigation focusing in three particular points. I mean, this extension was just one year long. Uh, first of all, we focus on the fusion of Sentinel-1 parameters together with Sentinel-2, how to deal uh, with coherence in steep mountains, and also how to use coherence to map forest targets. In that particular case, we added an additional test site in Finland in order to get the inform in order to get sensitive to, to large forests. So, as you may imagine, uh, as we are playing with interferometric data, we are dealing with a large amount of, of data. Uh, we are using, or we were using multiple year uh, SAR images over different locations. So, in this case, what we did is to uh, use the, uh, the, the, the results of the, uh, of the site project, which was presented indeed last Monday in this conference, where basically we uh, were using geocoded SLC geocoded SSC products in order to, to do not need uh, to storage the, the, the interferon. We also had the data with, uh, with Sentinel-2. So basically, uh, and we are going to present the results. So the, the, the first results that we were doing is to, to do land mapping in Doñana. So here you have the ground truth. So basically, this is the, the, ground, uh, the ground truth of, for land mapping. We are uh, covering, uh, or we are, not, we, we are not sensitive to different crops. We are just uh, having the information about crop areas, uh, forested areas, I mean, large areas. And here you have the cost on the Corine, on the Corine basis. But in the 2019, we got an extension of the ground truth. So therefore, we were able to identify different types of, of crops, and we were able for the first time, to quantify the or the, the advantages of using interferometric coherence for a different uh, or, or to different uh, to map different uh, different crops. So these are the technical aspects in, in which we process the Toniana test for classification. We use random forest, uh, basically because with random forest we have we have the capability to measure the influence of each one of the input parameters. We were processing at polygon level, at pixel level. We were able to, to, to evaluate uh, that. And 
we were using three years of data with a normal data set, and when, uh, and the 2019, we used also the extended uh, the extended data set. So with that, we could also a, a, were able to evaluate the consistency of classification among different years. So we produce all the data, all the data cubes associated to that. So we were able to combine, and then we evaluated the classification of the random forest against the different configurations. So here you have the first results. These are the uh, land classes identified with Sentinel-1 in the middle with Sentinel-2. Of course, we can make the combination, and this is the result of you obtain. That's not very informative, but if we look at the, at the misclassification, you can see that in some cases, Sentinel-1, sorry, misclassifies uh, some of the fields, the same for Sentinel-2, but if we combine both of them, we, uh, we can observe that we improve the classification accuracy. And this will be a constant. Basically, the main message of this presentation is that one of the messages is that the overall accuracy is not very informative because it merges the, uh, the, the information of all the classes. And the idea is that in some classes, for some classes, Sentinel-1 is the, the best, or the, even the coherence, the best to classify. For other classes, the best is Sentinel-2. We also evaluated the effect of time. I mean, we were using a, a sequence of additional images to improve the classification. So what we observed in the case of the intensity, sorry, in the case of, of, uh, of the intensity is that as we increase the number of images, we improve the, as expected, we improve uh, the classification accuracy, but we reach a kind of saturation effect. Apparently, if we use coherence, this saturation effect is uh, not so large. So that means that adding more images improve our classification. Of course, we can combine both, and the results follow more or less the average of, of, of all the, of these two behaviors. So basically, as we add more images, we were um, we improve our overall accuracy. In the particular case uh, of Sentinel-2, we observe the same situation. As we add more images, course, more information, you improve your classification, but reaching also a kind of saturation effect in the same way as Sentinel-1. If we combine both, we observe that there is a slight improvement as we combine both, but as I said, these plots are plotting the overall accuracy, which is not very informative because uh, the Important information is the classification accuracy for individual classes. We were able to combine also uh, only polarimetry, dual pole. So we were using ascending and descending passes. We were using coherence. We were combining all of them. We were combining intensity with coherence, combining all of them, and finally combining all the atoms. So basically, the, the message here is that coherence is help to improve uh, the, the, the classification of this for many different classes. And of course, as we increase the number of observable, we increase the overall accuracy. And as you can see, we can reach classification accuracy of 97, 98%. If we compare the results, this is for the, for the simple ground truth. So you see that there is a consistency between the years. There is a slight decrease in 2019. We still don't know why we have that decrease on that year. And also, if we extend, if we use the extended ground truth, we, we see a drop of the classification accuracy. But again, this is because we have a more complex ground truth. We have to distinguish more classes. So of course, we don't reach this number. But they are still acceptable. What happens if we combine Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2? In here, we show the figures about uh, Sentinel-1 alone. There is a consistency between the years, uh, except, as I said, for 2019, Sentinel-2. And in Sentinel-2, we also observe this slightly decrease of the overall accuracy in 2019. And if we combine both, we observe the same result again. If we use some more complex ground truth, because we have to distinguish more classes, of course, the, the, there is a drop on the overall accuracy because, as I said before, uh, the improvement comes into the different, into the different individual classes. 
the second package of this of this uh, of this project was to uh, make regional classification on difficult sites and in this particular case we were focused on south tyrol in italy being the border between switzerland and italy is a, is a very difficult area where you have to classify mountainous areas this is the ground truth we have so here you have all the mountains here you basically you have the valley and here you have the city of bolzano so this is the ground truth we were using just to evaluate how we classify the data in order to uh, to make this uh, this evaluation we use uh, a fairly complex uh, uh, identification of the of the ground truth uh, of the valid pixels to classify based on the use of sentinel one and sentinel two so we were using those pixels to classify first of all we took ascending and descending passes so the result is quite obvious depending on the geometry and here the geometry is uh, super steep in Doñana the geometry is basically flat so there are not many differences between ascending and descending in montanic region of course you are forced to use ascending sorry descending and ascending and you have to combine them because they see different uh, topography and different geometries okay these are the results and we were also uh, of course you have ascending and descending the problem comes uh, how to fuse uh, this information on the one we use uh, we basically pre-classify before the merging or we post-classify uh, 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 after the merging pre-classifying we obtain an overall accuracy of 65 percent again remember that this is a very difficult area so we don't expect to have those large numbers of overall accuracy if we post-classify we have a decrease of about 10 percent on the overall accuracy so apparently it is better to classify and then merge the classification result instead of merging the data and post classifying again uh, we were uh, classifying uh, we were uh, evaluating uh, the classification accuracy uh, in in the years of the of the acquisitions in this particular case we did five years from 20, uh, 2017 to 2021 here you see the overall accuracy basically you see a consistency among the years and if you if you see again you see the result here that for some classes uh, based on uh, sentiment one uh, the uh, int the intensity the use of intensity and coherence improved classification in some classes and other classes sentinel one is not the best uh, data to classify in using sentinel one and sentinel two we did the same the same type of uh, the same type of analysis so here if we use sentinel one we use uh, sentinel two sorry we we obtain about 71 percent sentinel 265 and the combination is uh, 71 again those numbers if we pay attention to those numbers one could conclude that sentinel two is better than sentinel one but at the end in some classes sentinel one improved the classification accuracy of sentinel of sentinel two finally what we try to do is to also explore the use of interferometric coherence the amplitude only amplitude to classify forests in this particular case we had to face the important limitation that the uh, c-band co interferometric coherence on forested areas is very low but at, la at least we wanted to test if that could be done in that particular case we use or, or we process two two test sites in finland in 2000 uh, from 2017 to uh, 2018 these are the the areas so these are sorry, these are super homogeneous areas in terms of forestry and here you have six day coherence okay so you can see that already on forested areas this is a flat area on forested areas the coherence is very low so the main consequence the main conclusion here is that at the moment is with c is it's very complex to distinguish different types of forest here we see the temporal behavior uh, for every for uh, for the whole acquisition campaign from uh, 
changing from 17 to 18. And as you can see, the interference is very low. So basically, for classification purposes, the use of interferon climatic cohesion on forested area, at least on boreal forest, is quite challenging at the moment. Just to conclude, uh, the results of, of this SYNCOMA project, uh, of the two and the extension, the, the original and the extension, is that interferometric coherence can be a very useful parameter uh, to improve uh, classification, to improve uh, thematic classification, uh, especially uh, on agricultural, on agricultural uh, areas. The combination with Sentinel-2 also uh, leads to an, an improved classification accuracy and also when we uh, have to uh, to deal uh, with classification on difficult areas due, due to the, the topography this approach is to use uh, ascending and descending passes we have also observed that the system we have developed has a consistency among the years so it's not a, just a question of luck that we in one year we obtain super good classification and in another year we don't obtain that uh, i have to say that the use of time series uh, is a kind of a robust approach against uh, temporal effects because we are using the complete year. So more or less, uh, we are filtering out automatically those uh, images or those pixels that are uh, outliers for, for classification. Finally, we, we have used also the same approach for forest classification on Finland, but at the moment, the results are quite preliminary because we have to face with the important problem that temporal decorrelation on forestry due to the wind, basically. It, it is very low, so it makes it difficult to classify uh, or even to identify the targets due to, to this low coherence. So this is the end of the end of my talk. So now uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. So time for questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so you mentioned in your this slide, like uh, there are some crops type for which S1 is better than S2. Mm -hmm. like, can you give some more details about that? Like which crops are, and what, what may be the reason for that? Yeah, uh, basically uh, for those crops uh, where in SIBA you have penetration, which are more or less kind of sparse. Uh, so in those cases, and with uh, uh, for instance, like wheat or I mean, DRV, if they are not really packed, you obtain uh, basically a better classification with, with, because with microwaves you are sensitive to the whole to the whole pack of the plant. Nevertheless, with Sentinel-2, you are only sensitive somehow to the top part of the plant. So that's our first impression that when in crops where you have uh, can exploit the advantage of sieve to penetrate, you obtain better classification. Okay. And also, uh, when, the, tem uh, when uh, the, the plants are very stable in time. Okay. And one more thing, like you mentioned that coherence is like slower to saturate. Like, can you give more details about that? Coherence is slower to saturate? Yeah, what, what the, the, the observation we have done in, into the project is that while in the case of intensity, you arrive to a threat to a, to a set of of images you don't improve uh, classification it stays on the same in the case of coherence we have observed that there is a monotonous increasing of the overall accuracy it is true that at the end when you add many images the increase is very low but we don't observe such a strong uh, saturation effect in intensity and is there for any specific crops? Like generally, like if you see rice, it no, saturates we, after some time. I don't know. They say, I, I mean, we didn't in the frame of the project. We didn't. We didn't go beyond uh, the classification uh, rates for each class. We didn't enter into the physics uh, to analyze or to cop or to or to link the classification with the physics. We didn't go that far. Thank you. Welcome. Here. Yeah, you have to use the microphone. 
Okay, in the case of the Doniana test site, we had a ground truth provided by, by the local uh, the local people, they were they provided us a, a ground truth. In the case of uh, South Tyrol, the region provided us also a proper ground truth. So we were able to, to, to test against that ground truth. And in Finland, uh, we, didn't ha we did not have a real uh, ground truth in terms of type of species. Uh, we had some information about the species the percentage of a species per pixel, that's the information we had. But as the coherence was, was so low, we were not, we didn't even try to classify because only with coherence. So in that case, the approach we are using is just manually label based on Google Maps or based on other things, just to create an artificial ground truth and then to test, uh, to test against that. Yeah, it is difficult. To obtain the ground truth is the most difficult part of any project. Thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, a quick one. Did, did you, did you uh, in investigate the, the role of, uh, of uh, VV and VH polarizations, which are uh, yeah, uh, again, the, the, the advantage of one or another polarization comes with the uh, geometry of the, of the plant. So basically, on those plants that are straight, like wheat, for instance, BB is better than BH. For plants which are more irregular, brushes, uh, it seems that uh, HB is better because it's more sensitive to the to the volume effect. So whenever you have double bounce effect, PB is the better. Whenever you have volumetric effects, BH is better. Thank you, thank you. Welcome. Thanks, thank you, Thanks, Car Car Carlos. So we can move on to the third uh, presentation, which will be given by Eleanor Ainsko. And is about uh, improving the versatility of post disaster damage mapping algorithms by combining in-SAR coherence and SAR intensity correlation. Okay. So, oh, Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Eleanor Ainsko, and my co-authors on this are Junkyo Jung and Sang Ho Yun, um, who both did quite a lot of work on this topic before I did. So, uh, yeah. So the outline for my talk today is first of all introduce you to what we're trying to do with damage proxy maps. What are they? Uh, explain what the existing method is for making them, and then propose a new uh, improvement that makes them uh, perform better over a broader section of cases and then show the results of testing the new method. So first of all, uh, our aim is to produce what we call damage proxy maps, so sometimes DPM is the acronym. And this is an example up here on the right from the Morocco earthquake last week or over the weekend. Um, and you can see it, so it's a raster that essentially the aim is to show a proxy for damage. Um, so in this case, the red and the, so the yellow and the red would be uh, increasing probability that we think these areas are identified as damage in the earthquake. Um, so you can use them visually like this, maybe in a GIS or in Google Earth, um, or you can combine them with population data sets and with administrative boundaries and roads for more sort of quantitative and downstream products. Um, so why do we need, uh, why do we make these with SAR and why do we need them? So after a disaster hits, what responders need to know is, first of all, was there any damage? Um, so you might have heard that an earthquake or a typhoon has hit a location, but then the responders who are coordinating it probably aren't in the same location. Um, so first of all, sort of, do they need to respond at all? And then what's the scale of the response? Where do they respond? How do they plan their response? So uh, where are the buildings and infrastructures that are damaged? Uh, are the areas that are damaged accessible by roads or not? And then uh, as a sort of more derived estimate, what's the number of people that are affected by the damage? 
Uh, so you can imagine that if, it's, if the disaster is one landslide, it's easy to answer these questions sort of on the ground. But for particularly things like an earthquake is, is the most obvious example. Um, if it's a widespread region, you need remote sensing. The sort of response phase, the timeline uh, that they have is 72 hours. So the sooner the better is always a very big priority in the disaster response, but 72 hours is the sort of approximate window, um, which means that we need to use SAR in order to reliably get results. Um, we use both ALOS and Sentinel-1, and then if you combine ascending and descending in some areas are covered by three tracks, um, you can normally get, uh, so you can normally kind of get a result pretty quickly. Um, I think one of the themes of the, the sort of uh, round tables for the conference has been one of the recommendations for future missions and for ESA. Uh, for us, definitely, revisit time response is the, the most important factor. Um, so uh, I'm from the Earth Observatory of Singapore. And in our remote sensing lab there, we have an operational system and we have a team that produces uh, these image proxy maps routinely. So this is a snapshot from uh, Sang Ho's poster from a previous conference, but it just illustrates uh, some of the events that the team's responded to over the past few years. Uh, we have a Southeast Asia focus, um, but if we get requests from elsewhere, uh, we do respond to events uh, all over the world. And you can see there are uh, lots of earthquakes, also typhoons, uh, some volcanic eruptions, and then even the Beirut explosion as well. So it's a variety of uh, types of damage or causes of damage that we're trying to map. Uh, and sometimes you get these simultaneously as well. So the existing damage proxy mapping algorithms are based on coherence change detection. So I've shown a figure here of the kind of most simple scenario. So if the red star is the, is the disaster, the event, uh, you take two star acquisitions from before the disaster, you make the pre-event coherence, that's the sort of coherence under usual uh, conditions. You make the co-event coherence as soon as you have a, a scene after the disaster. And just by looking, you can already see uh, in this example, just by looking at uh, the coherence difference, uh, this can be a proxy for, damage, for the damage. This is the kind of basic damage proxy map, is the loss of coherence. Um, ideally, so the minimum there would be three scenes. Ideally, we'll have a multi-temporal uh, set of scenes. So we have... Uh, more pre-event scenes. Um, this allows us essentially to characterize the, the sort of usual behavior of each pixel better. Um, so rather than just having one snapshot of the pre-event coherence, we make a lot of pairs, uh, a lot of pairs of pre-event coherence in multiple scenes. Um, we can do a correction for the temporal decorrelation, and then you can produce a probability density function of the coherence. <laughs> Uh, so essentially, it just gets us a better statistical representation of uh, how each pixel usually responds under normal conditions, because of course there is some, some natural variation. Um, so by doing the multi-temporal method, we can get uh, better accuracy damage proxy map in the end. So that's the existing algorithm. Uh, it works well in urban areas, it's tried and tested, uh, but it still has some difficulties on rural or sort of mixed pixel areas. So uh, if the coherence is always low to start with, then it's quite difficult. It's not so sensitive to coherence loss if the pixel is always low coherent. So this includes uh, rural pixels, or it can include mixed pixels, where you just have quite sparsely distributed buildings amongst sort of trees and vegetation as well. So uh, the example that I'm showing up here is kind of a worst case scenario. It's sort of a fairly hilly forested area in Japan, and then you can see along the middle, uh, there's an agricultural area along the river valley as well. Uh, and the histogram, so I've made a damage proxy map for this area, uh, and then I've just plotted up the values of the damage proxy map. So, uh, hang on a second, right. so if this building solid histogram is the damaged pixels, uh, and this one is the undamaged pixels, uh, we're not getting very much separation between these two classes. So really, ideally, we want the two classes to have quite different values on the DPM. And with the existing method, uh, in this case, it's not separating very well. It's quite a tricky area. So a solution that uh, has shown to work better in rural areas is using intensity correlation. 
so this is not any interferometry, it's just looking at the, the backscatter intensity. But it's a similar type of uh, thing. So you take uh, a window, hang on a second. Yeah, you, you sum over a window uh, similar to coherence, and then you uh, look at the correlation between pairs of sarcenes. So you look at the, the consistency of that window of backscatter uh, over a pair of scenes. Um, and essentially, we use the decrease in the intensity correlation as the proxy for damage rather than the decrease in coherence. So I've shown uh, the same area as I showed before. The blue is the, the coherence method, and then if I show in red is the intensity correlation method, uh, we can see that they're getting quite a lot better separation between the damaged pixels and the undamaged ones. Uh, it's not perfect yet, but it's kind of a bit better separated than it was before, at least. So uh, we want a method that works well in all cases. So we know that the intensity correlation works better for the low coherence pixels, uh, and for the high coherence pixels, the coherence-based method, the existing method, uh, works well. So what we're proposing, so I guess you can see that uh, up here. So if you look at this is increasing coherence, uh, the coherence method, the existing one, uh, works well up at high coherence, and then you can get even higher. Uh, but as, low as you lower the coherence, it drops off quite a lot. Whereas the intensity correlation uh, holds its performance quite well, so uh, quite well over low coherence pixels. Um, actually, I was so I was surprised when working on this that it turns out the intensity correlation also still performs quite well uh, at high coherence as well. So it seems like it's uh, it's not quite as good as the coherence in the most urban pixels, but it still uh, does a decent job. Uh, so to kind of merge these two approaches, what we do is a weighted mean. Um, so the eventual damage proxy map uh, is just a sort of weighted mean. So there's the weight and then one minus the weight here. The weighted mean of the coherence method and the intensity correlation method, where the weight is a function of coherence. Uh, yeah. So you can see uh, this is the idea. So the idea is that it should uh, use the most appropriate method for each pixel eventually. So this is the results uh, from some landslide damage in Japan. So uh, yeah, an optical image post event. This is the existing damage proxy map. And you can see, I guess, some red patches here uh, around the place. And then this whole area, uh, you can see some variation, but it's kind of uh, yeah, not particularly distinct. The, the new joint method uh, is on the right here. So uh, you can see, I guess, uh, quite a different pattern of the red and blue. So here, I should, I should say, uh, red here is just a high value of our damage proxy map. Blue and green is low values. So like, uh, the red would be more likely to be damaged uh, in that assessment. And if you plot over uh, polygons that we've got from a later aircraft survey, uh, you can see that that uh, uh, matches the validation data pretty well as well. Uh, so the existing one, isn't uh, picking out, they put lots of landslides here, the existing one just isn't picking out very well. Uh, whereas the new algorithm is able to match up these black polygons quite a lot better. I guess here is a quite a big, easy one. Around here is doing better as well. Uh, yeah, and then in this area where there aren't so many landslides, this area is kind of more distinct, more blue and green, uh, better separation. So this is an example from uh, along the roadside. So you can see this is from afterwards. So this kind of white and blue areas, a landslide scar, and where they're replacing it. This is the main landslide. And you can see, so the existing algorithm does quite well along, or it did okay at picking up some damage along where the road was and where there were some uh, sort of buildings next to the road. But it's not filling out the polygon so well as the new algorithm. Uh, I think the new algorithm does a bit better at these other smaller landslides around the place as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, our main sort of the area that we care most about, our main biggest priority is still the urban areas. So you want to check that we've not, uh, the last thing we want to do is make our method worse in the urban areas than it currently is. 
Um, so this is uh, an urban area in Sapporo city. So it had some liquefaction around about here uh, as a result of an earthquake. So the existing algorithm, you can see this bright red uh, patch over here. Uh, and the new algorithm essentially is very similar, um, which is what we expect. We don't expect the new method to beat the existing method in urban areas, but as long as we maintain the performance, uh, that's what we're going for. Um, this polygon, uh, it's kind of the best one that I could pick. There are a few different versions uh, published of where exactly the liquefaction happened. Uh, so I'm kind of relatively, although they don't seem to align exactly, I'm kind of pretty happy with the uh, with the mapping here, I'm, yeah, we're comfortable with that. Um, so we've also, I've just shown you this results in sort of picture form, but we've also done a more quantitative assessment. Um, so this is just a sort of sample of you rather than boring you with too many bar charts. Um, but you can see, so the, the, blue, the blue ones are the existing method, the red ones are the uh, proposed joint method. Uh, and 0 0.5 being sort of guesswork, one is perfect. Uh, so you can see that uh, just for these ones, first of all, for ALOS, you can see that the uh, proposed method is performing quite a lot better than the existing method. For Sentinel-1, the performance uh, is quite a lot worse. So I should say that so the ALOS data set here is quite high resolution. It's a three meter strip map. Uh, so it's a different wavelength and a different resolution. Um, and you can see that Sentinel-1 is noticeably not as good as ALOS in this situation, uh, but the proposed improvements are helping, uh, uh, yeah, are improvements. And for the urban area, essentially, uh, the new method matches uh, the existing method. Uh, yeah. Um, so then, uh, in conclusion, so the new uh, joint damage proxy method using the weighted mean of coherence and intensity products uh, performs more consistently across different land cover types than either of the methods alone. We've tested it on uh, ALOS2 and on Sentinel-1. It it's the, improves both of them. Uh, the high resolution ALOS2 data performs better than Sentinel-1, um, but the priority for us is always just a quick response time. So we're willing to accept some loss of performance uh, if we can get a response time faster. Um, and then you know, if Sentinel comes first and then ALOS will update uh, our product as data becomes available. And then uh, the intensity correlation method just by itself uh, usually performs moderately or quite well, uh, which I think is potential for the future uh, to get damaged proxy maps if you can't do anything with coherence, if non insert capable satellites, uh, there's sort of potential to get uh, a damage proxy map just from intensity correlation uh, before any other data becomes available. I think from current satellites, they're still, uh, the intensity correlation might not perform as well as it does for the more stable Sentinel and ALOS, um, but I think it's definitely, yeah, has potential. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. Thank you for this super nice presentation. I have two questions. Uh, as you use coherence, uh, did which is the filtering you use to, to estimate coherence, or which is the dependence of your results on on the on the size of the filtering? To oh, I see. Uh... The, we use, a, I guess, we use a window. We don't do any filtering beforehand. We use the window, a sort of box, just a rectangular box for the filtering. Uh, okay. Coherence, yeah. How, um, many, how large is the window? So for the ALOS, in this case, we use sixteen by sixteen. Okay. I can't remember what it was for Sentinel. Okay. Um, I have tested some different window sizes. Uh, obviously, if you go too small, your statistics aren't so good. Um, and then if you go too high, your resolution is less good. Um, yeah. But somewhere within that sort of range. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah. percent of it was smaller than 16 by 16. Okay. Um, I wanted to keep some resolution. And my second question uh, goes to the comparison between Sentinel-1 and ALOS. Mm -hmm. Because Sentinel-1, the revisit time is uh, six days or 12 days. Yeah. And for ALOS, it's 24 days. Yeah. So um, did you... I think 14. 
14? Yeah. 14 days? Okay. I think. Yeah. Okay, so so you were comparing 12 days with 14 days. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, I can't remember if it was 6 or 12 days. Um, yeah, so essentially, uh, we don't just do, we don't only make the, say it's 12 days, we don't only make the 12 day pairs, yeah. we also make the 24 day pairs and the 36 okay. day pairs um, as well. Okay, um, and with Alos the same. Yes. So, but, but the, the, the building block is in, uh, in the case of Sentinel is 12, in the case of uh, Alos is 14, that's. Yeah, I can't remember exactly okay. if, this is, if this is 12 or 6, but. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Okay, because this is not some important thing. Yeah, you so, can detect some changes in with one system, and you cannot detect those changes with other system. Yeah, I guess shorter is shorter is going to be better always. Okay. Um, we do uh, so because we use uh, pairs from different temporal baselines. Mm -hmm. um, we do fit an exponential curve to try and correct for the sort of temporal decorrelation. Um, so it, that sort of sort of As should you mean that the model is exponential. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a double exponential. Um, double exponential? For the, I guess the idea is that there's a volume scattering and there's a ground scattering, um, so it's okay, a double okay. exponential model. Okay. Um, it, it, it does improve the, well, yeah, it, it allows us to use more coherence pairs, I suppose, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, which is the threshold you use to classify like a change or no change in the damage? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I skimmed over that. Um, um, so in the, I guess the scientific product that we produce, it's no, we don't use a threshold. We just, uh, yeah, leave it as it is. Um, and then. Uh, but I mean, sorry, but you, you then consider a drop in the density correlation when you have a this drop, you consider this damage. Oh, sorry, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be for back here, I guess. Um, so what we do, uh, we don't need to use a, a threshold so much because we, uh, oops. yeah, so we have a, a set of sort of dozens or a couple of hundred uh, pre-event pairs. And what we do is we make a probability distribution um, of what the intensity correlation is expected to be. And then we look at the co-event intensity correlation and see where that lies on the probability distribution. Um, and then that, that value is the, the damage proxy, essentially. Um, so if it's sort of, if it's completely normal, it would have a value of 0 0.5, I guess, and if it's exceptional, it would have 0.99. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh... Well, if it's a quick one. It's a quick one. Okay. Um, I was hoping to know a bit more about the about what out, outreach programs you have for this. Ooh. So obviously making these uh, these uh, damage proxy maps is, is really impactful. Of course, in the days following a large earthquake or, or something, it's very unlikely that those teams who actually are responding to it are looking up research online. So what are the outreach projects to, to bridge this gap? Uh, so, uh, Sang Ho, I guess, he's uh, been leading this project for a few years now. He's uh, done a pretty good job of setting up collaborations already. So, we're part of the Sentinel Asia um, Consortium program, uh, which is a sort of existing network that connects up yeah, users, responders with people like us producing scientific products. Um, so, usually we don't... Uh, I guess if it's very clear that a damage proxy map will be needed, we'll start producing it anywhere as quickly as possible, um, but often we only, we make them because of in response to a request from them. Um, and then we've also we had contacts at the World Food Programme who sometimes make requests um, and then for other events, kind of as and when. Um, yeah, the outreach is kind of always ongoing, but we do have some existing sort of networks for that, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, cool. I hope you can probably pay much better. <laughs> nice advertisement. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, thank you. And now we move to the fourth presentation, which is from Deodato Tate from ASI. Uh, 
and it's about innovation in insert processing and analysis of CX and L band SAR data for natural hazards, agriculture, marine and coastal applications in the framework of ASI's multi mission, multi frequency SAR program. So, uh, good morning. Um, I'm very pleased as one of the two program managers for the Italian Space Agency to present today. Um, a summary, uh, because uh, and there will be many more results to, to be presented, uh, coming out from this uh, national program, the multi-mission and multi-frequency program uh, that we have uh, funded and uh, carried out uh, at the Italian Space Agency over the past three years. The agency has funded uh, 10 uh, research and development projects. Uh, starting uh, in April 2021, and we successfully completed all of them uh, by last July. Uh, this program uh, was, uh, was meant to help the national community, both the scientific and the commercial one, uh, to grow in their capability of processing SAR data with two key novelty points. Uh, first of all, uh, processing data all together. So not only focusing on one uh, particular band. So the main focus was the multi-frequency, using uh, these various types of observations, given that uh, fortunately we are in an era where satellite missions are now providing uh, different types of observations. And the second point, uh, L-band SAR, because in 2021, uh, we basically uh, witnessed uh, a comeback from uh, the L-band missions, in particular with the new mission uh, called the SALCOM from CONAI. And so as part of the um, institutional cooperation that we have between our agency and CONAI, we provided the distant projects with the opportunity to uh, test uh, how to use the algorithms already developed for C and X band, and in the past with L band with ALS, uh, with L band uh, with SALCOM now. So all these projects were meant to be pre-operational. So it was not only about research, but also prototyping products. And that's also the motivation for this presentation to be in this session about thematic mapping, so thematic products um, addressing specific um, applications. So just to give you the broader context, uh, uh, this program uh, fits uh, in a precise position in our uh, downstream and application development roadmap at national level. So it's a sensor-specific R&D program. So we focus on SAR as well as with other program, uh, for example, on hyperspectral optical. So the, the aim with these typologies of program is to nurture the development of algorithms up to a scientific readiness level and associated the technology readiness level at least uh, of six, uh, according to ESA SRL scale. In preparation for, for them, for being engineered, for example, in thematic exploitation platforms, and then directly used uh, systematically and routinely to address a specific application. And that's something is already ongoing uh, with the new national program, which is called Innovation for Downstream Preparation, I4DP. And some of the projects already completed in this uh, multi-frequency uh, program uh, are already being part of this uh, um, demonstrator and incubator. Uh, I mentioned 10 projects. Uh, they were spread across the five main R&D research areas of interest, from agriculture to urban areas, natural hazards, and also cryosphere, sea, and coast. All the 10 projects had one uh, common activity, validation. So uh, we wanted uh, these uh, prototype products to be validated with ground truth data. So I'm not going into the detail of all the 10 projects. Some of them are also here at Fringe. Um, uh, two days ago, there were some posters on uh, Creosar, one of the cryosphere projects. Uh, there's also a poster on Mozar, another project dealing with infrastructure and natural hazards. I will mention uh, some um, results coming out from that project. And tomorrow, you are all uh, invited to attend this very important presentation on uh, the new parallel SBUS uh, 
uh, processing chain to fully um, process CELCOM data also on a systematic way. Uh, the agency basically supported these 10 projects, not only with funding, but also with data. So we provided the Cosmos SkyMed the first and second generation data, exploiting our new portal, which provides full access to the registered and licensed users, to the full catalog of, of our data. Uh, and I stress the point uh, that we have included the second generation because in the meantime, uh, in 2021, we had uh, both uh, uh, the satellites, uh, one already operational and the other one uh, being launched. So um, all these projects benefited of these two components of the constellation. And of course, because it was a national program, they fully relied on our Map Italy project, basically a systematic acquisition plan started in 2011 and now strengthened with the second generation satellites collecting every 16 days in both geometries all over Italy. On the other side, we have also distributed the SALCOM data because in the agreement with CUNAI, we are the only provider of SALCOM data within the zone of exclusivity, which is the zone that you see in the map, so including all of Europe, Svalbard, Turkey, and Mediterranean region. Uh, basically, with this program, for the first time, these data were uh, disseminated, both archive and uh, uh, newly tasked. Um, and in particular, nowadays, uh, the Italian Space Agency is collecting systematically, not only over Italy, but also over Europe. So also for, for users uh, outside these projects uh, and program, uh, these data are, uh, are available. So please do come to Italian Space Agency if you want to access SALCOM data within the zone of exclusivity. Outside is a matter that you manage directly with CONAI. Um, some achievements. Uh, providing this data uh, helped us to achieve a very important scientific goals. Um, as of July, uh, we basically provided distant projects around 6,000 images between uh, CSK and CSG, mostly, as you can expect, the strip map mode, the single polarization, to support both interferometric and change detection analysis. Uh, one point uh, that I would also stress, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, we exploited the systematically uh, collected acquisitions um, in interferometric mode, but we had also the opportunity to test the new capability of CSG, in particular the quad pole strip map images. Uh, that's uh, a key novelty of the second generation, for example, for maritime application. The fact of including the two CSG satellites together with the other three from the first generation allowed us also to improve the amount uh, uh, of uh, tandem pairs, so pairs collected uh, with one day uh, time lapse in between. Uh, and therefore, for example, in this case, in the Saragri project led by CNRIA, actually by Alberto's colleagues in Bari, um, we were able to demonstrate that X-band, uh, mm, surprisingly, uh, given the, the theory of the capability of X-band on uh, vegetated areas, was able to capture tillage events uh, thanks to these uh, very high uh, temporal revisit, thus re reducing temporal decorrelation. And in this project, Saragri project, starting from the original algorithm developed by Sinararia since 2018, which is basically an incoherent, an incoherent change detection approach, combining Sentinel-1, uh, both polarization data, and uh, NDVI from Sentinel-2, was possible to generate this tillage um, uh, mapping products, discriminating till and non till the fields at the spatial resolution of 100 meter, which is unprecedented and suit exactly what uh, farmers and um, you know, companies managing uh, huge uh, lots uh, need for this type of assessment, especially to feed in their reporting uh, to the common uh, agricultural policy of the European Commission.
and combining one day tandem pairs uh, from Cosmo with six days Sentinel-1 before the failure of Sentinel-1B, of course, we were able to demonstrate the Cosmos Skynet reducing the, the, the revisit time not only corroborates uh, tillage events that are clearly picked up by Sentinel-1, but also adding new information. So we can better estimate the amount and the sequence of these uh, tillage practices. Up to the point, the CNR area basically prototype uh, these mapping products, which are basically an early estimation of the amount of winter or summer crops uh, in order to predict the crop yield uh, that we should expect uh, in, the, in the investigated uh, um, crop uh, and phenological cycle period. Uh, with SARCOM data, we basically um, provided around 2,000 products split among the 10 projects, dependently uh, whether they were focusing on interferometric time series analysis, a change of direction, or a feature extraction. And because of that systematic acquisition plan that we are now implementing uh, um, continuously over Italy and Europe, uh, we have already achieved uh, during the duration of the program at least uh, 20 SALCOM images per single geometry for each area of interest with revisit time up to eight days, which means the full capacity of the constellation. And this is growing because with this program in 2021, we started the disacquisition program that wasn't yet uh, uh, in place at that time. And again, as we did for Cosmos Climate, for SALCOM data, we also tested some capability offered by the various imaging modes, including the quad pole strip map images, for example, for soil moisture retrieval, and I will show you an example from the Clipsider project. So basically, adding all these data sets, we could explore their interoperability. One of the points, of course, for example, for agriculture is in increasing the temporal resolution. We know that maps of soil moisture retrieved from Sentinel-1 are very helpful, but still not as much as farmers would like to receive, because we need to increase the, uh, the temporal revisit. That's something that combining uh, uh, different sensors can be achieved. And you see here a dense time series combining uh, uh, these two sensors, basically achieving across the various areas of interest uh, up to five to three days, which is uh, enormous. Uh, if you think that these are uh, missions also managed by different space agencies and according to different observation scenarios. And of course, the uh, quantitative values are already encouraging. Uh, in this uh, slide, uh, I want also to stress the point that having uh, these different sensors can help us uh, to achieve uh, maps at different spatial scale and coverage. You see here what has been achieved in San Agri project by CNR area, uh, full acknowledgement for their uh, enormous efforts to achieve these maps of surface soil moisture. Uh, with Sentinel-1, of course, across the whole region of Emilia-Romagna region in the northeastern part of Italy, and an upgrade at the finer spatial resolution with SALCOM data, finding a very good match. Uh, I mentioned before that with SALCOM data, we can also uh, test the different capabilities for soil moisture. This is uh, just uh, one of the results that are becoming uh, publicly available because we are starting publishing papers and also presenting this research um, at conferences. That, uh, in July, we presented this paper uh, at Tigers in Pasadena. As you can see from the plots, for example, uh, using uh, specific collections of SALCOM data, in this case, in a site in Argentina, thanks also for our Argentinian colleagues for providing this data. For example, we observed that for low NTVI values, the data are in line with the model. However, we also observed that co-polarized SARA backscattering coefficients are overestimated. On the other side, on the plot on the right, you see points characterized by high NDVI values, and they tend to approach the values that are simulated uh, by the model. So you see the value also of using uh, different polarizations 
um, provided by, uh, by these new sensors. I'm now moving quickly uh, towards the end of the presentation from the agriculture to ground motion and natural hazards. I just anticipate some of the concepts that you will see tomorrow in the in tomorrow morning presentation by CNR area in Naples. Uh, we developed uh, in these uh, projects uh, uh, full processing chains with Salcom, of course, adapting and adding uh, some key steps uh, to suit uh, the, the specificity of this uh, Salcom data. So full details will be provided tomorrow. Just to point out that this full chain is now capable to systematically uh, process uh, the full strips uh, because the idea is to achieve with Salcom the same type of services that are already provided with Sentinel-1 and Cosmos Canyon. And this was feasible, uh, of course, with the uh, suitable processing uh, uh, resources uh, in this project. And um, uh, yesterday, uh, you also probably um, attended the presentation by Sinararia showing this result over the Campi Fligrei Caldera in Naples. And uh, these values achieved uh, by Salcom data match uh, with what uh, was observed in the past with the C band from Sentinel and X band from Cosmos Climate. Just to mention that. Uh, Towards the integration, we need a way also to combine this data. CNR area started this, this process. So basically, in a site like Campi Fligrei, where we have a plethora of data, they basically created uh, uh, the way to uh, process them together and retrieve a vertical displacement component and horizontal component maps using the various data sets. And as you can see in these very first examples, the algorithms retrieves deformation rate not only where all the uh, data sets overlap, but also where at least the coherence pixels are available for two independent acquisitions. And uh, uh, soon uh, you will see presented also the results in terms of accuracy assessment. Something that also Nazca company did in Musar project in this case for land subsidence, starting from the three different processing with Cosmos Sentinel-1 and Salcom, they put in place a very, uh, I would say, performing mathematical model, also to account of the various information that can come from these sensors, either persistent scatterer, interferograms, and also deformation estimates from photo monitoring using optical data. And uh, with this solution, they achieved also a better um, estimation uh, of the north-south. I'm going to conclude. Um, for example, in this area in uh, south of Italy, because uh, together you can better resolve the 3D displacement components. So also the disadvantage of INSA along the north-south is, uh, is uh, at least uh, mitigated. And very quickly mentioning that uh, you will see uh, coming up results uh, from ship detection uh, project like COAST, because these data are very advantageous also to discriminate different types of ships, and also to improve our algorithms for wind field estimation. So as you can see, uh, this program provided a, a very wide portfolio of opportunities. So in conclusion, uh, this program was a test bed, uh, definitely to prepare the community uh, in, uh, in advance of their coming uh, El Bandas our mission, but also in the, in, in the next phase uh, that we see at the moment, uh, which is uh, in, in some way challenging and also stimulating how to combine all this information coming from various uh, uh, source sensors. Of course, to make this the work well, we need uh, temporarily collocated uh, data. And that's something that we achieved uh, during this program because as a space agency, we coordinated also with the observations plan of Sentinel-1 and we also systematic planned SALCOM data. So uh, we hope as a recommendation coming out from Fringe 2023 that we continue also developing uh, such synergies. And thanks, sir, for your attention. Thank you, Dodato. Uh, I propose to move directly to the next presentation as we don't have much time.
And if you have questions, please do ask. Yes. Yeah, probably yes, thank, thank, you. thank you. So the last presentation for this session will be given by Tesfaye Temdime Tesema. I don't know. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> Uh, and is about in SAR coherence analysis a proxy for change detection of uh, pigments. Thank you. Should I be here? Uh, almost good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> it's about uh, lunch time. I will, I will uh, uh, wrap up as soon as possible. Um, this work is uh, just uh, initiation of the project. Uh, just if it is uh, feasible uh, to. Uh, uh, take the the I mean the lead, I mean the developments in earth science application to uh, civil infrastructure, especially for highways uh, and and so forth. Um, so uh, the motivation behind this work is just to uh, um, whether we can uh, use uh, satellite uh, remote sensing just to uh, see the the approaches that are well developed, such as uh, non-destructive testing uh, uh, or visual inspections and this all, uh, they are limited in space and time, but if we, uh, is it possible to use satellite data set just to uh, do large scale uh, monitoring so that uh, we can uh, um, a little bit contribute towards that uh, reducing the uh, or integrating the ground-based uh, methods to the uh, satellite base. This is really, um, so the ultimate goal is maintenance and road safety. So these are basically the um, uh, type of deterioration on the highways and roadways. And uh, for example, if you see the, the middle one, the sinkhole, I don't know the, yeah, yeah you can see the three. Uh, so, um, uh, for example, the one that's uh, the sinkhole in uh, Norwich that, that happened uh, uh, in 2021. Uh, whether is it is it possible to to detect before before the, these things happen uh, by, by by seeing different changes? So um, the limitation pr uh, perhaps might be um, due to a spatial resolution of the Sentinel the, the radar uh, satellites. Um, as you go to the high resolution, which we are we are in need of, uh, the cost in the the available um, um, methodology might be expensive. Uh, as you see here, the, I mean the scale uh, uh, varies from a few few meters to uh, kilometer. So um, just to give you a, a, an idea, uh, the traditional and non-destructive testing methodologies um, um, versus the satellite uh, the potentials. This kind of methods, we, we, we use very advanced methods, well established, they can detect, uh, uh, I mean, issue, uh, issues with uh, the highways in different ways, but uh, they are really limited in, in terms of repeating the, the measurement and then the scale of that. But uh, for, the, for INSAR approach, uh, there are network level, uh, network level analysis, uh, for example, for this one, uh, for deformation analysis, we can, we can see a, a large scale. Uh, but um, for um, just to to, to 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 show you our test site, the city area is in in Italian information area. There are different variety of works we are working on at the moment on that area. But typically, uh, the, this one is just to see the the deformation around that uh, that that area uh, because this area is 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 a well known, well studied area in terms of deformation uh, as a uh, SBAS or PS uh, PS uh, INSA uh, area. This is the the, the one we, we are um, working on at the moment, and uh, it's not our our really ultimate goal for to see the deformation and then uh, see the variation changes in in the, this area. Is it um, our our ultimate question is uh, is it feasible to detect changes from the coherence at this scale? Um, I mean, previously, you and others also the, showed us in a large scale, uh, very big change, um, uh, and with with a limited number of uh, acquisitions. But for if you uh, uh, see in detail the, uh, the multi-temporal approach to see the coherence analysis, um, uh, whether it's feasible or not. Now I am learning a lot today 
about this kind of uh, things uh, in my, my background is just to see detect the uh, changes uh, in terms of uh, an analyzing the, the phase of the signal, not, not the coherence. But uh, I learned a lot today. I, I'll not go through this to, to explain these whole things. But you can see that clearly the change can be detected as you see in previous in the previous um, um, presenters as well. Uh, but for now, um, I I will talk about a little bit about uh, change detection yeah, for pavements. Is it is it is it feasible? Because I we see in volcanoes and damages. Uh, for uh, due, due to earthquakes, there are so many uh, um, researches and then algorithms. But for is it possible to do to do that for pavements? So I'm I'm putting questions uh, not only uh, uh, for my, our group but for, for for you guys because you are well well, well expert in on the, on this area. So I mean I will get more information on this. So the approach I adopted is the from Langley. Uh, which he uh, published in 2019. Um, we do the, the time series analysis and then uh, pre photo for the, the coherence map. And then uh, there are two uh, methods that they proposed. One is the change detection matrix uh, for change analysis, and then um, the, do the uh, coherence change map over, uh, over the time period. Um, so uh, at the moment, uh, uh, really, uh, I am on, on, on the starting uh, stage of uh, uh, do, doing the things that I showed you the time the PSS analysis and then um, see where, where we can focus on just to understand the situation. So there are the big steps, um, I mean, uh, um, uh, methodologies that they implement, algorithm they implement, the, they call it the, the CDM uh, um, construction, which is basically uh, making it my, a matrix of uh, by by glittering they, they use some uh, glittering box and uh, I mean uh, car box glittering kind of thing and then with uh, they identify chains you know change and then they do some 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 similarity and measurement and then use uh, and then local temporal interferometry coherence estimation particularly they apply this one for uh, volcano um, um, uh, chain detection. But uh, uh, I'm really interested on that, just whether I can apply this one for the um, for for uh, um, large scale. So, uh, as I told you, uh, we we are, we are, we, are, we are not yet on on applying the, the methodology. Why we are here, just to to propose the me the methodology and if it, if it is feasible uh, for, through your experience in the, in, 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 the, in this episode. So we think that there are um, some data set we used for uh, from Gela and also from the ISA. So we thank you for so this or projects. There are similar projects going on, but so we are focusing on to particularly for this one, just to go further to see if it is possible to add to to work on a large scale um, network area uh, for um, this civil infrastructure monitoring, especially for highways. Thank you. So thank you. Any questions? Yes, there is time time for uh, questions. Anybody? A question, if I may. Yeah, you 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 presented that you are using, uh, I guess. Sentinel one and data Terrasarix. and TerraSarix. Yes. Okay, what do you expect from from X band data? For the X band data, the resolution, the spatial resolution is big. So uh, as we compare, I mean, um, as we when we see the deformation map, it it, it maps well uh, the the highways, but um, um, the resolution might be limited. Okay. Uh, so we are going for that. That's that's why I'm putting the the. I mean, the spatial resolution uh, map just uh, as, as a constraint. Okay. Thank you. I think that, that uh, if you're interested in, in the very high range uh, solution, you could, could also 
øh, øh, US Cosmo, Cosmo øh, øh, Sky, Sky Mountain. Yeah. Maybe also in in a um, uh, spotlight mode, which is you know uh, quite high higher than uh, uh, solution. So you could interact with uh, the data for this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is why why we are here. Which is the knowledge that they are using because they don't have the access to that. Okay, so now we are going to close the session. We would like to thank all the speakers and the audience, and we invite all of you to come after lunch for the discussion part of, of the session in this same room. Okay, thank you very much. I saw you in here. I
Okay. So we are going to wait for a few more minutes before. And the airport. Sure. Should we start? Maybe, yes. Okay. Should I? Okay. Uh, so thank you for all for coming. I mean, it won't be a big party, apparently. So, uh, now it's the time for a uh, overview of what uh, it has been presented uh, in the previous part of the session. So now the, the goal of this uh, of this session more than uh, starting a scientific discussion or which can be endless. Uh, okay, uh, here we are more interested into. Uh, arriving to a kind of consensus about potential recommendations of, uh, that uh, we should present tomorrow in the final session for ESA about many things, scientific uh, ideas, uh, future projects, uh, future missions, whatever. So together we have prepared these six questions that you have in here. So we don't want to go through all of them. So. Uh, I prefer better to open the floor uh, if someone would like to start through a particular a particular point. It is clear that in the session, many of the presentations have focused in some way or another on the use of uh, interfer interferometric coherence, particularly the amplitude. Uh, no one has in this session, um, as far as I, as I was aware, used the phase at, at the moment, especially for thematic mapping and for uh, change detection, which can go on the same basket, basically. So now, I mean, we open the floor for your comments, for your recommendations, for your, uh, any comment is, is welcome. Okay, so if you have any, any comment, any idea, any recommendation you would like to. Okay, yeah, I can start probably linking uh, to the recommendation uh, that I provided after uh, my presentation. <coughs> uh, in particular to answer uh, the first point. Uh, I guess uh, that we need any way to, uh, to strengthen the, uh, the importance of making a synergy between these uh, new missions, uh, as we are trying also mm, to do with the current missions. Uh, because uh, 
if we think about Roselle and Sentinel-1 and G, at a certain point in time, these missions uh, with, uh, will uh, overlap and provide simultaneously uh, different data sets. And one of the issues, uh, as well as an opportunity that at least our national community has raised, is that we have a plethora of this data, but sometimes it's difficult to, to uh, make them work together because um, paradoxically, uh, they are not temporarily collocated. So, for example, for some specific applications like agriculture, that's a key point. We saw also mm -hmm. on your presentation, in that case, it was uh, uh, combining a SAR plus a multispectral optical, but the, the concept could be extended, of course, across the domain mm -hmm. of, of SAR. So, definitely, uh, thinking uh, since now in planning uh, uh, synergy between uh, this, uh, uh, this mission. For example, Harmony uh, is uh, meant to, to work together with Sentinel-1. So again, uh, thinking about uh, temporally collocated uh, uh, imagery and also in that case uh, also to, to perform the static observations. And then with regard to the third point, uh, so additional studies, the campaigns, uh, to better understand the role of interferometry coherence? Definitely, yes. Uh, the suggestion would be in order not to make a fragmentation effort, um, uh, it would be better to invest on same um, test sites, because uh, in the past decade, especially in, Euro in Europe, we have identified uh, sites that are used for calibration validation mm -hmm. of different missions, either optical and SAR. So uh, doing studies and campaigns uh, on areas where we have not only previous uh, measurements from satellite, but more importantly, ground truth data, uh, would make this investment, even if it's small, uh, more, uh, more advantages with a better return. Regarding the, the synergies, uh, because uh, if you attended to the session on Monday, where they presented the Sentinel missions, I mean, ISA has already in mind to think as a system of systems to combine all of them. But I think my opinion is that this synergy should go beyond the simple idea of system system, which is nothing at the end, to be honest. And I was thinking that maybe one way to uh, to push this synergy would be uh, to provide uh, analysis ready data, same grid, same everything. So especially for those who are not experts on and I mean, not expert in remote sensing. You have maybe experts in agriculture and know much more than, than us. So, so I mean, I was thinking that always as they see this synergy is a, is a, is a password at the end. But okay. It's, yeah. But I mean, if ISA could, my opinion, and one of the recommendations, at least retaking what uh, Deodato has said is, to go beyond that and is to provide analysis ready data. And also we saw in, in some of the presentations on Monday, uh, geocode SLC data. So that could, it is potentially very useful to use coherence for people who are not expert because you can put everything in a G yeah. GIS. No? So that would be a recommendation. Please go ahead. Yes, I think is that this kind of session is very important also to underline the importance of different backgrounds of scientists because, for example, I'm a geomorphologist and, uh, of course, I'm, I'm not really into the technical part, but I want to learn and the help of engineer or uh, yeah, other... Yeah. It's very important also to underline this kind of uh, synergy <laughs> of different... Uh, yes, background, and I was thinking about the second point, and yes, maybe it's uh, very important to have uh, also products that are uh, uh, maybe simple also to download, to uh, use for every application. Yeah, analysis ready data at the end. Yes. No, that's, uh, I think that, that 
ESA is, is, is going into that direction. Uh, they want to, to, to go into the, this kind of uh, geocode SLC, but it's still not decided which way to go. NICER will go into that direction, this I learned too. But I think, I think this is a, a very good recommendation just uh, to increase uh, usefulness or, of SAR data beyond our small community. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I think for uptake also, um, the ease of processing to higher level products. So if we provide geocode SLCs, that's great, but many people who are interested in the products don't know how to make coherence. So I guess uh, carrying on investing in SNAP, which has improved a lot already for processing Sentinel in the past few years, I think for thematic mapping, SNAP is a really uh, useful and much sort of used tool. Mm -hmm. Um, or even sort of on-demand processing. Uh, I know ASF in Alaska, they do some on-demand processing to sort of uh, higher level products. Um, even something like that, I guess, would also help to expand. Um, yeah, require, uh, it lowers the ent entry, entry barrier. Okay. So, I mean, <clears throat> This is this is a good point. This, uh, oh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, I was wondering uh, the presenters this morning see if you have ever uh, checked um, if you lose uh, information when you work in SAR geometry or in geocoded uh, geometry. So because if uh, ISA, if we want to propose ISA to to deliver this uh, coherence in geocoded mode. Um, are we losing information? Uh, anyone has analyzed that? This is an open question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even I, I was sure. talking to colleagues this, this, this morning about this aspect. Uh, as far as I know, there are no studies that compare, I mean, something very basic, statistics on uh, the radar geometry and the statistics of SLC on the ground geometry. That's the first step that we should. Uh, address. I don't expect much differences, but someone has to do that study. Yes, so maybe we don't lose yeah. anything. And with, with the amplitude could be easy because we have both now. For example, in your case, that your classification is done in such geometry and then you project the results no, or uh, not? Because as I said, we were working already on geocode SLC. So we were working on that. But that's true. That uh, previous step to understand when you have an SLC, how they, I would say, how the statistics change from radar geometry to ground geometry, that study has not been uh, done yet. There are another, another, another problems because uh, as you are geocoding also phase, it is, it is not clear to me if that geocode phase could be used for a differential interferometry and all these kind of things. So it's still an open question. I know that NISAR and all the new missions would like to go into that direction, but as far as I know, there are no such studies. If, if you have seen the presentation by Payu Chakram, he, 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 he is proposing this kind of pro mm. products and uh, he made some studies on that. that it seems that, you know, he, 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 it's a good trade-off uh, to, to okay. use such, such products oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. also for itself for uh, phase. So, of course, there is a compromise, but how far is this compromise? This should be quantified. Okay, yeah. so we, we can put that recommendation then to, to study that. Yeah, just to, to add a little remark on that, um, when we do the geocoding, we do lose a little bit of information because we will have to do resampling nearest neighbor or when, you, when we choose our method, so we would lose a little bit of precision. I didn't do statistical work on that, but I was noticing it and trying to, to work around it when, when in, in the recent study that I was working on. Okay. So we do lose a little bit, but we don't modify okay. the information to... Big so we could say that there are already some preliminary studies that show that you lose something, but it should be quantified, or at least you give the product. I mean, at, at the end, you give the product and the, and the bars, you know, the, the, the uncertainty of the products, 
or the errors, no? It, it happened to us even to work directly on radar data because we don't want to lose uh, the information on borders. So, for example, when I was mapping for landslides, I did the mapping on the, the radar data and radar geometry. So I will not lose when there is a sharp edge and I will when and I want to pass into uh, geographic geometry. You, you, you will lose some information. Mm -hmm. You'll keep the form and everything, but you might be less precise if you want to do some mm -hmm. static statistic after. Okay, so so we can put that recommendation. I mean, to to promote somehow a study that uh, quantifies. Uh, I wouldn't say the loss of information, but what? Yeah, just to quantify the effect of this. Uh, uh, I would say on the statistics first, but I mean we can go beyond the statistics. Okay, so we can we can go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering. I've worked a bit with um, geocoded SAR data, um, and I've noticed that a lot of the time, especially when you get into the high resolutions, um, you notice. Uh, like these distortions, which are due to poor DM quality. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering how much of an impact you think that has. It might not be so much on the flat ground, but I know on mountains that I've looked, you can see these jagged edges and it's not great. That's another layer. I mean, uh, we were thinking, I, I had in mind just flat areas, but of course, if you go to steep topography, you have that problem on top. That's, yeah. that, that's true. That's true. I mean, is that something that missions like Harmony could perhaps solve by yeah. making their own TM? So if we go through the uh, to the to, to these questions, uh, I mean, this would basically. Uh, answers uh, question number two. I mean, we should provide those products, but also not standalone, but with some kind of information about the compromise or the information you have got. Uh, in the session, as I said before, we have seen several applications about the interferometric coherence for uh, temporal coherence at the end, for thematic mapping, for change detection. Do you think it would be important to push ESA or to recommend ESA to have new studies on uh, the information context of interferometric coherence, just alone, link it to uh, some kind of application, uh, comparing different frequencies, different polarizations, different things. Do you think it's useful to have those, uh, those studies? And also in synergy with other kind of mm. data, let's say, for example, we we I think that yeah, you raised a good point. Uh, I mean, to push uh, uh, if it is possible to push uh, the I mean the usual um, work. Uh, I mean uh, deliverables um, that are uh, available. But um, if you go to the uh, civil aspect of uh, I mean uh, these observations. There are there are some doubts for the on on the on on the community that especially for uh, when you come to high resolution data set uh, um, there might be some uh, for for example for geolocalization there is the, when you do you only use geo reference data sets uh, sometimes it, it it misses the the, the actual location and there's something like that the projection issues. Mm. And uh, similar similar aspects. I mean, uh, so if there is a focused, st I mean, uh, group or I don't know, uh, target to um, targeting civil uh, infrastructure applications okay. a bit more than uh, large scale application as well. Okay. I mean, you, you, there is one, uh, as far as I know, there is one, uh, I mean, one framework in which you could 
include this civil application, which is maybe urban areas, is where you have. Yeah, but I mean, they only focus in, urban, uh, in, in buildings, basically, as far as I know. Uh, but there are no people, as, I mean, at least in the community, I haven't seen going beyond that. But this is a good thing, I mean, uh, not just to focus on trees, plants, and this, but to focus more on civil things, where resolution is, is an important aspect. And maybe where these uh, geocoded products may face more problems. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay, and want just to say something about the third, the third interesting question. So, um, should additional studies or campaign be initiated to better understand the role of uh, interferometric coherence? In my opinion, yes. And uh, also the European Space Agency can uh, have an important role, maybe uh, promoting um, some products based on the interferometric coherence. There are very few studies uh, in the context uh, of, for example, of road pavements. Um, today, TESFA has presented some preliminary results. In my opinion, this is a very good point to work on this type of, uh, of information because uh, when you want to monitor an, an infrastructure, the multi-temporal INSAR approach are well acknowledged, but very few studies uh, comes in the area where no persistent scatterers can be detected. So maybe uh, the um, insert coherence uh, can be used also to detect uh, particular areas that change in time, mm -hmm. um, signalizing maybe some some problems. Uh, so this this is my point of view. Yeah, we have seen, for instance, your presentation where you use coherence for some particular things. I also saw. Uh, a presentation by Thomas Nagler from Austria, where he used uh, coherence in Greenland and in Antarctica. Uh, we were using for classification. So, but as you said, maybe everything is scattered, so there is no. If, if, if I got your point, you, you you think it is important that ISA uh, shows the benefits of coherence. That what you mean? Okay, so how ISA could promote that in, from your point of view? For example, uh, giving some processed products of coherence updating in time and uh, uh, also um, for maybe promoting the exploitation of some softwares that uh, can be integrated in the, for example, SNAP tools that are now uh, exploited by the European Space Agency and so on. Okay. Somebody said that it is difficult to prescribe uh, the use of coherence because you should uh, fix also which baseline you would use, and and so it's a little bit you know uh, it's um, uh, quite uh, application dependent. So it, somebody said it's better to have SLCs, maybe. Uh, uh, Geocoded, so you can extract coherence uh, as you want. But but you know, uh, I think it's an open quest. quest. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I have another question. I, I was thinking in real time. Uh, you know that coherence can be decomposed in different multiplicative terms, and so on. Huh? This is a traditional theory. We have to take into account that, for instance, uh, uh, as far as I know, Sentinel-1, uh, Sentinel-1 NG, uh, not biomass, but um, Rosal, will have nominally zero baseline, space baseline. Okay? Uh, uh, biomass will have a baseline because uh, they want volume sensitivity. That's a different history. But most of the uh, products will, or, or most of the systems will be zero baseline. Also, nicer is going to be uh, zero baseline. So, do you think it would be important also to specifically focus on the analysis, the modeling, to study the temporal decorrelation by itself? Because, uh, as far as I know, there are just this exponential model 
or combination of exponential models. Uh, in agriculture, they use multiple exponentials. In our lab, we use also uh, this exponential, but I know there are some other models, other models, but there is no clear consensus on the, the real. If there is an additional, an additional model, or if a temporal decorrelation could be used for other, for other things, because at the end it, it will be with uh, these operational systems, the only more or less decorrelation term, uh, decorrelation term we will have access to. So I don't know if someone of you have experience with modeling, analyzing, or studying specifically the temporal decorrelation at different frequencies or, or so on, or would like to add some comments on, on that. My experience, maybe that was part of why you were seeing that uh, you keep on adding more coherence and um, your performance for months of the classification check by improving. <coughs> because I guess you're improving up in the next sense because you see the temporal decorrelation. Okay. So it seems like your results have been like a one way useful, or they don't start having some extra value. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't know what you think about the results. No, I'm. No, I didn't thought about that, but maybe, maybe this saturation of this thing on coherence we had with classification is an is, it's an it's an expression of this exponential model. But when analyzing theoretically and purely the temporal decorrelation, of course, I mean exponential model is the first shot you have in mind because everything in nature falls exponentially. But I don't know. Uh, if this model is still valid, for instance, I have colleagues in, back in Spain that they have tried to apply that model to agriculture. It doesn't work and because they have to apply multiple exponentials. They have to locate the, the starting point of the exponential, the decay. I mean, it's too complex. So I don't know if it would be, it is worth to, to, to push effort or to put efforts into, in, into these studies of temporal decorrelation, theoretical studies or for different, of course, it will be, Application dependent. This is, uh, I don't know if you think it, among these studies, we propose one of them could be to better analyze theoretically and uh, the, de the dependence of, of this temporal decoration of the application. I don't know if you have any other comment on that. The number of positions for this example, it depends a that was already the researcher already using that okay and other than that i in uh, in my research on the bias that we observe on vegetation with the multi-temporal insert uh, when we do spatial averaging i i used the temporal coherence in order to be able to detect the, uh, the pixels of, uh, of vegetation. And I used it, the, the coherence, I used it in several forms. So I used a proxy of temporal, temporal coherence, and also I used um, what is called, uh, we called it coherence dispersion, which means how, a pixel, how much a pixel is coherent in time, is it consistent or not? And it was very, very useful. Okay. So it was, it's just small. Things. Okay, so I mean, we can at this propose this recommendation just to make some effort. How this will be crystallized, I don't know, but I mean, at least to push into the, a better understanding of the mechanisms, physical mechanisms behind temporal decorrelation. I think this is going to be very useful. Of course, as I said, it will be application dependent, but at least to, to, to make some initial work in that direction and could be very useful, especially for systems with a zero baseline. Okay, so we can put that. And if we go to the fourth question, uh, do you think, uh, as uh, it is written in, in the slide, the coherence alone can be an important source of information or it should be complemented with other sources of information? Or it, the, regarding your your experience, in 
my experience, coherence alone is never sufficient to, to do change detection because it's too sensitive. It, it, it needs almost all, all ways to have some, uh, some additional channels, be it uh, some intensity, be, mm -hmm. be it optical data, but coherence alone, you know, as uh, you said, said is is very uh, faint. It, mm. it, it, it vanishes quick, quickly for uh, many reasons. So okay, uh, now this is what you show. I mean, yeah. when you go to low coherence, you have to switch to another thing. We presented this morning also in something into that direction. So, so I, I, the answer is there. Huh? Okay. You have a portion where intercoherence is sufficient, and the neighboring portion. It's not sufficient. So uh, that means the parameter coherence uh, awareness is kind of carried or nothing. So even in the same way. Okay. Any other comment, recommendation you would like to add? I think we. Could close. No? Yes. We are not so many. We can close <laughs> fast. So we will wrap up all these conclusions. So tomorrow we will propose these uh, three, four recommendations: the analysis ready data, the uh, these things about uh, studies of um, of. Uh, the effects on the signal properties of these uh, geocodic products, the studies on the on the coherence with all the derivatives to focus more on civil applications uh, that we can we can also include it. Uh, and the, I think that's all. I mean, these three, four recommendations, we can collect them, we can propose them tomorrow and then see the feedback from 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 ISA. Any other comment? Any other question you would like to add? We are here all the whole afternoon, so in case you forget something and want to add, just come to us and we will add it. Okay? So we can close here. So thank you very much for your thank comment. You. Thank you very much uh, for your ideas. And now you are, uh, you are free for coffee or free for uh, and thank you for coming. I, mean, I really appreciate that you make the effort to come to this uh, particular recommendation session because it's at the, after the coffee break, at after the lunch. So, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so. Uh, write it down? Yeah, you, I mean, we, could, we could make it directly. Oh, yeah. I don't know which one. I think I'll put it here. Yeah. Okay.